Again, I advise members in the public gallery that they are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. And they connect to the assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available in the gallery rules. It is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. I could ask all the members to make sure that your electronic devices are switched to mute a mode to ensure quality of sound recording. Uh, would you like us to quickly go through the agenda? Uh, apologies, no, we're all here. Um, Members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting as applicable. There are some issues in during this uh, meeting, particularly around uh, questions on dilapidation, uh, that uh, uh, the various people approached me. I will declare that interest when we get to that part of the paper to, as, as we go through. Uh, I would like to inform the members of the draft minutes of the meeting on the 26th of February are at page 4. Are we content that the draft um, minutes are an accurate record of proceedings? Yep. All those in favour say aye. 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 Happy to be published on the website. Yep. Yes. Um, draw my attention to a matter arising at page 12 to a response received from the Department to committee request for information on the operation of in year monitoring. I'd like to ask members that are content to forward the response to raise to inform its development of the budget process and procedure. Are we content? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to inform the members that, at long last, the National Crime Agency has suggested a Tuesday the 12th of May for an informal briefing to update the Committee on Sales of the National Asset Management AG NAMA port Loan Portfolios Northern Ireland. Uh, members, are we content to meet on the 12th of May at 1300? Yeah. That's, a, that's a Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. They can't do it for that? No. It's slow. Is there any reason why it's taken so long? Sir, the, the, they did offer the 14th of April. Which, Which is, is Easter, Easter Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a public holiday to them, but it is to us. Mm -hmm. no. I would be content with the uh, to s get them to see them on the 12th of May. I'd rather see them sooner rather than this prolonging itself. Okay. All those in favour say aye. 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 Great. Aye. Uh, now moving on to oral evidence, and I would like to uh, over, overview and priorities for the enterprise shared services. I'd like to invite uh, Jim Crosby, Finance and HR Shared Services, Desi McDonald, hi Desi, uh, Properties Division. Exercise and building trust. Uh, one another. So Harrison, you don't mind going first? Uh, step up here on this chair. Close your eyes. Uh, Colm, welcome. <laughs> While we <start. laughs> welcome, Colm. And Iggy, welcome from Digital Shared Services. Sorry, where is it? Get the old one back. Wouldn't happen if I was using that. Let's drag ourselves kicking and screaming into the second decade of the 20th century, 21st century. Yep. Uh, John, could you uh, make your opening statement, please? Thanks. Yeah, just going to say a few brief words. First of all, we welcome the opportunity to provide the committee with an introduction to uh, some of the services provided by ESS. Uh, we provided a, a briefing paper. We're not planning to go through it. The way of introduction, you'll, you'll probably be glad to hear. But colleagues are here, and we'll do our absolute utmost to, uh, to answer questions on that. Just, just briefly, the services we provide are really underpinning, enabling services that underpin delivery of public services and, and, and central government services. Uh, so we we cover the, the the four of us here: finance, HR, IT, and accommodation. And obviously. Uh, there's not many civil servants or public sector workers that can deliver anything without without one of those. So our customer base is primarily central government departments and their agencies. There's the there's a bit of a range of coverage uh, in the footprint between the various services, but by and large, we all have at least 22,000 customers, i.e., the central government departments and, and their agencies. But but that goes up to about 28,000 in, in the case of IT. So that's basically all, all I want to say. Uh, the services you'll be familiar with them from the the briefing, and we're all here to take any questions that you might you might have. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Pat, well, thanks very much. I was wondering uh, when you're monitoring your performances on the pen of invoices. What's the most commonly cited reasons for not meeting those targets? Well, I'm glad to say that in terms of prompt payment, we're sitting currently about 97% on paid within the statutory 30 days. 
10-day uh, prompt payment, I think, was 93% this month. It's, it's invariably over 20%. I mean, getting an invoice paid in, in, in 10 days depends on it going through the normal procedures of being, being received, being scrutinised, uh, and somebody being prepared to pay it. So there are uh, the 10-day the, the prompt payment only applies to spare invoices, which is about 200,000 a year. So it's, it's simply going through the procedures of uh, deciding whether a good's fit for purpose before you receive them and, and so forth. It would be fair to say then that you're, you, you're, you're saying that you are meeting your targets? Yes, yes. Well, that's fine. And just one more. Uh, Lord Chair. Mm -hmm. sure. And uh, on what uh, green energy initiatives are being explored, explored by yourselves at the moment? Uh, that's um, that probably a question for Desmond. Yes, it is indeed, well, just within your <clears throat> portfolio. Well, what I can say is that um, we would conduct a range of um, investigations into what would make an effective green energy uh, investment. So, for example, across the estate we would put in uh, LED lighting, for example, the, the low energy lighting, which um, is, is very effective in reducing energy usage. Uh, we're currently uh, looking at a new contract for electricity, which I understand is going to be, if not entirely green, mostly green energy supplies. Um, and so, so basically, unless you have something specific, we would, at, at, at every opportunity where we're looking to do, particularly where we have works planned, then we would look at what we can do to save energy usage. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Yeah, can I talk? Uh, you're very welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, can I talk about the digital shared services? Something that intrigues me, and something I think that we we really need to, I suppose, excel excel on. Uh, the briefing doc document highlights the uh, the fact that there's 82 public sector organisations involved in the shared services. Can the officials give an indication of the percentage of public sector organisations represented by that 82? Yeah, um, in general, um, our focus initially in terms of shared services has been on um, the central uh, departments, the Northern Ireland Civil Service Departments, um, extending out to agencies um, and arm's length bodies. Um, so. Um, the initial drive for um, shared services, particularly on NI Direct, has been on um, departmental um, web services and uh, information services through the NI Direct service. Um, we deliver common IT services acro um, across all of NICS and to the wider public sector. Um, our data centre, we have a private um, uh, cloud uh, infrastructure um, where we host mostly all of the NICS estate and wider public service. Um, that uh, data centre houses, for example, it's extended out to health service provision for some um, other arm's length bodies. We provide services to PSNI, we provide other services to Tourist Board, to DVA. Um, so it's, a, it's really a growing um, extent of wider public services um, after an initial focus on delivering core services to Northern Ireland civil service departments. What, what departments are not availing of it at present? All departments avail of shared services in some form or fashion. Um, in some cases we provide common um, email, uh, and in fact we provide common email, desktop, laptop, uh, and hosting infrastructure for all departments. For some who get um, their IT services delivered, for example, um, in departments for communities, have got um, some of their um, universal credit services to, provided through a third party to uh, Department of Work and Pensions. So some of their hosted infrastructure is not hosted on um, digital shared services infrastructure although they, they do have um, the kind of underpinning um, desktop email um, infrastructure. A lot of their business systems um, are not. How shared is digital shared services? And what I mean by that is, how, how does it actually operate to the benefit and to the direction of what we want to achieve here in Northern Ireland as a joined up government? 
Yeah, that's a, a very good question and it's something which we have been um, working on uh, for some time. Um, if you look at the um, ICT strategy for the Northern Ireland Civil Service, uh, a strategy that Department of Finance led on the development of, um, it was a strategy that was developed in collaboration with all other um, NICS departments, so our digital leaders and our business leaders from all of our NICS departments were involved in developing that um, NICS ICT strategy. Um, the focus on developing that strategy as a shared strategy was to support the delivery of programme for government outcomes. Um, and many of the common themes developed um, as part of the um, the development of that strategy were there to address uh, better governance, um, improved information assurance, um, better security. Um, so a lot of the business requirements from all departments are um, included within that NICS ICT strategy. So the biggest kind of thrust of that strategy as well is to drive more value from shared services. So all of our kind of investment in IT is towards um, exploiting more value from shared services. It's a common um, uh, delivery means across government um, internationally, and it's a common theme. Um, so in terms of kind of driving more value from shared services, we also, um, that's, so the strategy is our blueprint. It's the roadmap for, for delivering and getting more value from investing. We've worked very closely with um, our procurement colleagues in updating the terms and conditions for contracts. So for example, um, what we want to do is for uh, civil service departments and wider public sector to a feel of the contracts that we establish so that and that they fit in with our strategy so that uh, there is improved interoperability and sharing of in information <coughs> in as wide a uh, possible base as we can. Thank you. Sorry, just sorry, Paul, just a question, just to, sorry for cutting across there. Um, the TEO use digital shared services, don't they? They do. Okay. Uh, one of the questions we've had on a previous committee was the issue of potentially remote working and working from outside within the framework. Is digital services looking at the opportunities for further remote working and the necessary security infrastructure that is tied to it? So that, let's say, you know, working from home, which is something that's going to be potentially of significant interest in the next couple of weeks or so. We, we do, and in fact, particularly over the last couple of months, we've seen significant advancements in um, secure remote access. So quite a significant number of um, civil service users use laptops. Um, a few years ago, the trend was to one desktop for every civil servant and a desktop telephone. Um, there is more of a thrust towards mobile working. In fact, in um, shared services in the office which I'm based, uh, we have an agile working environment where almost everybody has a, a laptop. Um, and more recently, we um, updated our security features and our secure remote access facility to uh, virtual uh, all, all was on. Um, so what that really means is that once you log in at the start of the day, it will uh, detect if you're in another government building. It will also detect if you're working from home. So that technology is available. I use it frequently. I have been in three different government offices this morning and I needed to log in only once. And when I go home this evening, I'll be able to open my laptop and immediately I'm online securely. We have secure laptops, secure encryption through the network and an extended network. So that facility is available to all departments. If TEO um, haven't, aren't making use of it, um, they can speak with me. And sort of all ministers have access to secure laptops and secure sort of remote facilities. So, so I suppose that the, te the technology exists, but there are other issues around um, policy for working from home and, and other issues around health and safety and so on, which would be outside the remit of what enterprise shared services can do. I suppose what 
enterprise shared services does is enable that sort of working, but the policies and the other issues that need to be addressed probably lie outside of what are. Yeah. So, yeah. of control would be. Yeah. so the technology is there, the electronic plumbing is there, it is achievable, lots of people use it, um, so it's, it's a question of individual departments having that, um, that uh, means of um, engaging with their workforce and having a means for, and you, you Are there refer to over the next kind of short while what may, be, what may happen, uh, it will allow for more flexible working. Are there targets there? Are there targets there for which departments have to achieve? <coughs> if they are, what do they look like? Uh, targets for, for what? For rollout or for better shared devices, sharing between departments? Um, th th there aren't specific targets for um, mobile working. The technology is there. Departments themselves can avail of um, the um, mobile working. So it's part of our service catalogue. Um, we don't specifically have targets to, for example, provide every worker, every member of staff with a, a laptop. It doesn't suit some of them. Um, so, so there are okay, some, sorry. Some, some departments or some operatives? Some specific business areas. Like what? Um, you may have some administrative support staff. You may have some specific... Um, um, uh, there may be areas of operational delivery where people may be required to be at their desk rather than working remotely. Um, but I suppose most and all business areas are now looking at the potential for that not to be the case, and the technology enables that to happen. But even at your desk, you should be able to tap into a shared service. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's not just about remote working, it's uh, about shared uh, services and uh, information flow. Probably. Uh, absolutely. So there are other benefits outside of the technology, I suppose, is the point that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that I would make. So there are other wider shared services, like, for instance, HR and payroll and finance, which John has talked about, which people... All, all civil servants and every member of, of all departments and agencies have access to, irrespective of where they log into their to their um, device. What does what does success look like? And how is it measured? So we we have in the past had customer satisfaction surveys across the various service streams within enterprise shared services, and that um, those satisfaction rates were Im were improving. We are now thinking, though, and, and the area that I'm responsible for is thinking about what the next generation of shared services would look like. So um, the measurement for that, there will be various measures, as you would imagine. Some of it will be efficiencies and some of it will be cost reduction or cost avoidance. But a big part of what we want to achieve is the customer experience. So, for instance, if people only have to log in once, and when they log in, they have access to their HR system so they can book a day's leave, for example, or they can query their pay slip, for example, or they can raise an invoice request um, and to make that experience as seamless as possible and also more in line with what people like ourselves are used to outside of the work environment. So we are all used to that sort of 24-7 instant access to those types of services. And that's Final questions, Chair. Can I ask then, is someone looking across the globe as to best practice here. I'm, I'm stretching my memory here, but I think it's Estonia as one of the most sophisticated digital government systems in the world. I think I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on record. Does, does anyone, is there anybody tasked to look at this yeah. technology hey, advancing um, around the globe? You are right. Estonia is um, one of those countries that um, is very much digital, not just digital first, it's almost digital only. Yep. Um, they had the advantage of being a greenfield site, yeah. so they had no legacy to deal with mm -hmm. um, in terms of legacy IT. Um, they, they, in fact, they're, the only way that um, the public can engage with um, government is electronically. Um, we do have uh, connections through to Estonia. Um, we also benchmark with other countries as well. We keep very close contact with uh, other devolved administrations. 
Um, so we will we, we meet with them regularly and look at what what they do. Um, Estonia were um, actually part of um, the governance arrangements for taking forward um, our digital transformation services. So we um, still have those contacts. In fact, I think we um, it would be useful to kind of resurrect those and continue on with those contacts as well. Thank you, Chair. It may be worthwhile the committee getting a research paper on Estonia on the digital. Government piece. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Yeah. All right, um, Gemma. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks. In your, oh, this has kind of been touched on um, already, but in terms of agile working, is that just between other government buildings, or do you have any plans on reaching out into other areas outside of Belfast and other government buildings and maybe leasing them or? That that um, that includes. Uh, I want to answer some of this, but in terms of the IT capability, um, it extends to the wider um, NICS estate. So, for example, um, we had a, a public services live event in Fermanagh uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and all of the attendees who um, presented at it uh, were able to use their laptops, switch on, and um, access the um, government internet from from that location from from other house. So um, that that facility of um, Wi-Fi and all was on is available in almost all government buildings. Thank you. I think, it's sorry. Sorry. Me, Chair. I think it's just worth saying that the facilities are there, but how people avail of them and how they deploy them and use them within their departments is the responsibility of, of the individual departments. And, and obviously business needs for various teams and so forth differ, and it's up to the, the line management and the accountable people within those departments to determine to what extent they avail of of things like agile working and remote access. Yeah, and you know, for 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 the agile working and for deploying um, more um, innovative technology, uh, we also have been driving more um, elimination of um, printing facilities. We've been promoting multifunctional devices, which are kind of um, large um, printing devices, which. Um, uh, in general, in a lot of our larger civil service buildings, we may have one or two per floor. Mm -hmm. In the past, you may have had 50 or 100 per floor. Um, that has drawn significant savings to the whole operation and security of printing as well. Yeah. Yeah. And just on the back of that, Charles, not to jump across what Gemma said, if there is a, a large uptake uh, with cross with the health scares that we have just at the moment, you, you, that, that would be able to be coped with? So I actually had this discussion yesterday with, with one of the departments. I, I think they, we have um, ability to allow concurrent access for 5,000 users away from the office at this point in time. So that's about a quarter or about a fifth of the overall civil service population. And it's probably close to the number of people who actually would have a laptop in the first place. And that, that ability to, to, for 5,000 people to log on can be spun up very quickly. So within hours, that capacity could be increased. So I think if we get to a position where a lot of people are either unable to or would, or would benefit from not working in the office, that can be handled. Sorry, Iggy, to jump in there, sure. but I had that conversation yet. Just, just to finish off on that point, we are looking at the uh, rollout of some agile hubs outside, uh, so that people can go in and work closer to home when they need to, or if they're for, uh, in buildings for meetings, mm -hmm. that they'll be able to do that. We already have some of those. We've already got some places where people can work remotely um, in other government buildings, but we're looking at a wider rollout of that. That's great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, a couple of miscellaneous points, just on the digital. Have there been any security breaches? Security breaches. We've been <clears throat> we've been um, very fortunate in the way that we manage our, our um, IT estate. In that um, we um, have, as we manage the email infrastructure, the network infrastructure, and the wider ICT infrastructure, <coughs> we have a very aggressive patching policy. For that, we make no apology. Um, 
if you recall back to the um, significant um, security incident um, of ransomware, which was um, the WannaCry incident from a few years ago, when large parts of the health service across the water, particularly in Scotland, um, had um, major outages. That didn't happen here. Um, and in, in other cases where there have been major breaches, it, it often has been due to um, a lack of <coughs> patching. We, we aggressively patch our systems. Um, we haven't had any major uh, incidents. Um, um, we don't always know of an incident. We are investing um, significantly in our cyber uh, defences and cyber security. Um, we have... Um, I've briefed all of the departmental boards on the responsibilities that, at board level... Are we fully compliant with what the National Cyber Security Centre asked us to do? That's exactly what they have um, asked us to do. So the National Cyber Security Centre, we have a very close working relationship with, and their advice is that... Um, that cyber security is a board level responsibility. In fact, it's a responsibility for every member of staff. Um, so we're promoting good cyber hygiene and as well cyber awareness. Um, we have recently established our own cyber security hub, which is available for every civil servant. And we have a, a, we're growing a central team uh, and um, increasing that resource and making that available to, to all staff. Um, so in, in short, we haven't had any major incidents. If um, there have been any incident, any specific incidents, they're handled at a local level, um, and any incidents are reported to the Information Commissioner's Office. Yeah. Are the systems accessible by civil servants, ministers' own devices? Some sy some systems. By their own devices, yeah. by like a home laptop. Yeah. Um, in general, they are accessed by a work laptop or a secure mobile telephone. Um, and and they're a government uh, issue, are they? They're not an issue. Um, they're, they're government they're, issue. They're government issue. So yeah. government issued <clears throat> laptops and government issued telephones are built with inherent security built into them. <coughs> So you can't have a situation where someone using their own device can tap into the system or use the system? No, that that's right. Um, in terms of the <coughs> property assets, uh, is there an ongoing programme of disposal of property? Yeah, the, basically um, from the last discussion we had around this, the, you may recall that there was a, a note that went out to um, <coughs> the NICS from the uh, from supply, putting a uh, not a halt, but making putting um, instructions in place for how you would go through uh, renewing a lease or taking out a new lease. So there there is a a program in that sense. Um, but that doesn't stop us purchasing or, or taking out a new lease if it's if it's a tactically wise thing to do. But are you moving from ownership to leasing? Um, it, it probably depends on the circumstances. It, it's it's more. I wouldn't say it's a purest choice between the two. I think a well balanced estate's going to have to have both because it allows you more flexibility. Um, but the uh, I think we're working back to the questions we had um, in a session a few years ago where we had um, taken out leases, even though the presupposition was that leases wouldn't be taken out. What's the future of Dundonald House? Well, that's an interesting one because Dundonald House is um, probably one of the trickiest buildings that we have got to deal with. Um, there, there's quite a liability there. It's um, likely to be listed. So there's going to be a significant amount of... Pray why? Dundonald uh, House? Dundonald House, yes. It's just ghastly looking. So um, through, 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 the, through the chair, Jim. Through the chair. Sure it's ghastly looking, it's Mr. Ghastly Chim looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to defend this. <laughs> All I can say is, is it's the only remaining example of the European style or some such. That's so it, 
it is likely to be listed. Um, we'll keep it. So it, <laughs> it, compounds, it compounds the issues. A few years ago, I, I think we've gone through cycles on this one. I think back to before my time, work this 2010, there was a proposal to sell it. Yes. Um, and there was primary legislation brought in to allow that to happen that was never taken forward. Um, then there was a, a proposal to knock it down. Um, that obviously because a listing would prevent doing that so you would have to work within the structure that you have now. <coughs> so the, the future in short is that it would have to be business case, it would have to be optioneered to see exactly what the best way forward for it would be. But one of the options for it is to, to bring forward the, the primary legislation and to, and, and to make it and to actually uh, provide the opportunity, should it be the only option on the table to actually deal with Dundonald House, to, to look at doing that. So you're saying spend a lot of money on it and then sell it? Um, no. Quite the opposite. Sell it. Sell it now, <laughs> I think. You think you can get a bar? I don't know about that. I'm not, sure, not, not convinced that there would be a bar out there for it. Is it, it presently totally done. used? Um, it's not completely used to the extent that a building with the net internal area that it has could be used. Um, but that is for a number of different. But we are places. leasing other properties and sitting with empty offices in Dundonald House. Uh, well, you're, yes, we are. We do have space in Dundonald House. Um, but given the difficulties that we would have with Dundonald House, I wouldn't really want to over pack Dundonald House at this point. Apart from Dundonald House, have the other spare space? Yeah, we have space across the estate. Um, we have pockets of space that fell out um, over. Fez, as you remember the last yeah. conversation we had, um, so we do we do have spurs in the state. Um, yes, I probably could. Um, we have uh, around twenty three thousand workstations. I understand now. There's a big proviso over these figures, so so do take them with a little bit of pinch of salt. But to give you an idea of the quantum, um, and we have about eighteen and a half thousand staff. So. Hypothetically, there would be maybe three to four thousand, what would be considered to be vacant workstations. But I'm, I wouldn't be convinced that those are all usable workstations. We would have to do a proper. But are you working to rationalise that? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. We're working to rationalise the estate. Yes. And um, can we expect that to manifest itself in savings? Well, we we have over since, since we last talked three years ago about this. We have got uh, out of 16 leased properties, and we have um, got away uh, from six owned properties. So that that will continue to happen. Um, sometimes in an estate, it is better to take out a new lease. For example, taking the example of Dundonald House, which would it be better to do to spend a large amount of money on Dundonald House, renovating Dundonald House? Um, and maybe not being able to utilise it to the same extent that you could do if you took out a, a lease or you bought a new building and you were able to mod <coughs> use uh, modern standards within it. So th those things have to be optioneered. It, it, Dundonald House, the, the future of Dundonald House hasn't been fully optioneered through yet, um, but there are a number of business cases in, in coming forward that are going to look at a number of options for how we're going to move forward in the estate. Well, speaking of getting out of estates, the um, out of leases, the, the committees had correspondence in respect of Leslie House, mm -hmm. where you entered a lease for 10 years from 2014 to 2024, mm -hmm. uh, and now have um, exercised the bread clause. Mm -hmm. And this also ties into how quickly you pay your bills. Because the complaint to the committee is that dilapidation payments of a quarter of a million pounds have been outstanding and not paid, though they were signed off by property division. You know anything about that? Well, what I can tell you is the that has now gone through. Um, I, I wasn't aware that it was outstanding. Dil dilapidations, as you probably know, can be quite a long and uh, laborious process. Basically, what happens is that um, a decision is taken to exit a lease and a payment is then made um, in lieu of making good the property. Mm -hmm. um, now, it goes through a process of whereby the 
landlord or the owner will bring forward an amount that they believe to be a fair and appropriate amount in dilapidations, and, uh, and it's almost like a counter offer that is made. That you go yes. through a process um, which brings in valuers, which will bring in our, our technical staff, which will bring in particularly our legal staff, and they, um, the, the, an amount is worked out and agreed. And then it's taken forward. So when you say that's gone through, when did that go through? It would have gone through in the last few days. Because on the 14th of February, when the landlord was writing to this committee, it obviously hadn't gone through. No, it, it hadn't at that point, no. So has it gone through on the agreed figure that was in the dilapidation release form? Um, I couldn't, I don't have the specific amounts in front of me, so I wouldn't say yes or no. Or do you think I was compromised further or not? I, I don't have the figures. I don't know. But you're telling us quite firmly it's settled? I believe it's settled, yes. Right. Um, I just sort of, does it just to sort of do it? Is this just one example or are there other examples out there? Um, I'm not aware of uh, anybody who has complained in terms of uh, a, a, an outstanding dilapidation list uh, payment in, to me in my time. Um, I would certainly encourage anybody that does have an issue, I'm, I'm happy enough to take correspondence from them. If, if For example, are there any issue. payments outstanding over 90 days at the moment? Um, with regard to... Dilapidation payments? I, I genuinely don't know because the dilapidation payments wouldn't be quite treated in the same way as other payments because it is, it's a process, there's a whole legal process that's gone through when you're making a dilapidation payment. So it's not just a matter of some, somebody coming to the department and saying we believe... Okay, I'm aware of that. But so, so how many, is this just a one-off example? Or I, is I, there I genuinely couldn't say, I couldn't say. I, I, what I can tell you is the number of leases that we have exited um, over the last three years is 16, so there, would, there may well have been dilapidation claims. I can certainly look into that for you. Yeah, if you could report back to the committee and yeah. see how many are outstanding, yeah. that would be quite useful. <coughs> could you? Any question? Uh, your briefing paper talks about the potential of infraction proceedings mm -hmm. uh, from the EU. Um, Money come in on this at the end. Yeah. Are there such proceedings anticipated? Um, and what's the impact of Brexit upon those? Well, it, well the, to answer the second one, I would assume it will depend on the how we exit. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the implications. I, I would think, <coughs> looking back, that the, if, if an agreement has been entered into, that the, the agreement may still stand. But I genuinely don't know how Brexit's going to affect that. With regard to um, whether there would be any infractions coming forward, um, in, in terms of a fine, it would be the first in my experience if that were to happen. Uh, but it is a genuine possibility, given that we are um, taking forward a number of pieces of legislation which are very, very close to the wire. Um, I would think that they're, they're... Is that mostly about energy performance? It's mostly about energy performance, yeah. <coughs> Back to the Donald House. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't have Donald House's energy performance in front of me, but it, it would be. Our, our issues with energy performance and with building regulations in general is that we do rely heavily on our, um, our colleagues and counterparts in England, and this is how this has always been done. But presumably, Northern Ireland Executive will be saying to the Westminster government that in any final withdrawal, arrangements, they would want an amnesty in respect of uh, inf infraction proceedings. Otherwise the money comes out of the block grant. Um, well, it, it depends whether it's, it's a UK-wide infraction or whether it's a Northern Ireland specific infraction. Yeah. If it's a UK-wide infraction, I assume but the that you're Northern, talking about Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, well, it depends. There, we're reliant on the UK as a whole is in an infraction position on those ones. It's just the fact that because we would lag after GB in terms of when we make our legislation, that we may be exposed at a point where they're not. Okay. So, Paul, well, you wanted to come in for just very short. Yeah, just well, I want to I want to explore more the the uh, dilapidation the dilapidation payments. Uh, so I, I can wait till last if you want, Chair, or I'll go now. It's up to you. Definitely happy for him to go now. It's a similar sort yeah. of topic. So, so just I want to explore more of Jim's questioning with regards to the the payments. 
Who actually signs off the payments on behalf of the department? I would. You would? Yes. And then when when should payment happen after this sign off? Well, well, payment, in my view, should happen as soon as the legal outworkings are completed. No, so, so surely you're signing off after the legal outworkings have been completed? Yes. So when you've signed it, is there a deadline or target? When I've signed it, it will happen immediately almost. In this case? So I, I wouldn't have signed that one. 28th of August this one was signed. You told us By me? No. 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 Well it wouldn't have it wouldn't have come to me on the twenty seventh of August and still be outstanding for payment, I'm assuming. So did you sign did you sign this particular one we're talking and it's, it's not fair because you're cold on this, but Yeah. So do, are you saying that you've signed this one? I off? think you're making me doubt myself now. Yes, yeah. But I think I have signed that one, yes, in the last few days. We, we, we often doubt ourselves in here. Uh, so can I ask them... At all, sorry, just to... All of the process has to be complete before it gets signed off. So the, the agreement is done, the legals are worked through, all of that has to be complete before, and then a, a, a final judgment is made on signing the thing off. Is there a 14-day uh, payment uh, target? For, the for for this, once you've signed it off, um, is that are you aware of that target? I wouldn't think so because the the quantum we're talking about these these are checks these are, that are generated. These aren't things that would go through the system. Yeah. So, <clears throat> is there ever a case, or when is it the case that the financial legal expert signs it? In what sense? So, if if there is a piece of paper where the legal, I'm trying to get a, an actual title. Uh, so you have head of office estates, mm -hmm. you have departmental solicitor's offices. Mm -hmm. So if they sign, if a departmental solicitor's office mm -hmm. signs yep. uh, the release form, mm -hmm. Is that not sign off? No, it's signed off when it gets to me and I sign it off. Would that have been once that legal financial legal officer signed that release form? Mm -hmm. Is that all the financial legalities complete? It should be yes. So where does that release form go to? I'm, I'm sort of visualising what you're talking about here, but I'm assuming if it's signed off. It would come to me at that point, but it didn't sit with me. If that's what you're trying to get. No, 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 I'm not. No, no. <laughs> it's it's just that that document is signed by the lesser and the lessee. Mm -hmm. So so surely, in, in in most right thinking people, the person who owns a building thinks that that has mm -hmm. been signed off at that point. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting, and they're waiting. Mm -hmm and nothing happens. They then contact the department. Yep. The department tells them to contact the legal services. The legal services then says no, contact the department. Mm. How, how can it happen that this gets stuck in a system somewhere? And it begs the question, how many more are sitting there with these quantities of monies sitting there going nowhere? Well, well I'm not aware of any other ones that are sitting there. Desi, I think just to draw a line under this, I think one of the things that we would have a concern of is the delays in this seem to be as if it's been done to stretch into the next financial year. Right. And the length of time that this is taking. Yeah. And I, we I, would can, I can just chair just reassure you, it is not, absolutely not being done to stretch it into the next financial year. Okay. Uh, Lisa? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going back over ground again here in the sense uh, that uh, just before you've mentioned that there's 82 organisations who say they're not involved at the present time. Uh, within the public sector, who are they? 
I forget exactly have clarity on that, and maybe the reason why it is that they're not binding to the direct service is not uh, at present. And is it the case like that um, that uh, they're possibly digitally excluded, mm -hmm. uh, and if that is the case, uh, what efforts has been made to uh, ensure that everyone uh, is included? And by the same token, then that when you would have that type of inclusion, I know this is three or four questions all at the one time in a sense, that uh, it's an opportunity then to, to sort of utilise or maximise the, the utilisation of government buildings uh, which at present I know that in some cases are underutilised uh, and that that could actually be um, accommodated by uh, decentralisation uh, as a result of that sort of uh, service or, or that um, Opportunity to be engaged digitally. Okay, well, just the last bit first with regard to the decentralisation for ourselves and properties division. We provide accommodation where people ask us to provide it. We don't um, have any real responsibility for choosing where people need to be located. Maggie, do you want to take? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the, the the point about digital inclusion is is is, is well made um, and. What we do in digital shared services is we um, have a very active outreach uh, facility where we have a number of dedicated staff who go out um, to encourage um, more um, digital awareness and digital capability with the public. Um, that's generally um, in association with Libraries NI. So we are doing more outreach work trying to encourage more of the public to uh, grow and develop their own skills. Um, in terms of those organisations who, the kind of wider public sector organisations who don't yet avail of um, all of the services of digital shared services, um, in, in some of those cases they're kind of separate legal entities and um, we can only encourage them to come online. Um, and for example, they don't all have um, common records management systems, for example. Um, they don't all have um, a common kind of email environment. Um, what we can do is extend um, the promotion of the facilities that we've got, um, and it's something that we are actively doing. In, ter in terms of the wider public sector, we have, we have looked at the potential for wider shared services in areas, for instance, of HR payroll and finance across the whole of the public sector. Um, that was a programme that I led, um, which included, for instance, the health service uh, and the education authority and education bodies, as well as central government organisations, which is what primarily the focus of enterprise shared services has been on. Um, the conclusion of that work was that whilst there would be benefit in, in greater collaboration and we are seeking to collaborate more widely with the other sectors, that based on, on the differing models that are in place within the health sector, the education sector and central government sector, that an in-sector approach to uh, increasing and extending the reach of shared services is what we should do for now. So for instance, in the next generation, of our existing HR and payroll and finance services. We are focusing on the people that we currently provide service to, but we want to, to let contracts and put in place arrangements that will allow others to join them <coughs> at, a, at a point in the future. But we're not, as, as Iggy says, in a position to force them or um, in the case where there are separate legal entities to, to mandate that they would come on board. But we certainly would welcome um, and, open, and are open to conversations and discussions with organisations who would want to join those those arrangements. Yep. Over the over the last year, we onboarded the the housing executive, where we um, onboarded 4,000 staff. Um, this coming year, we are onboarding libraries and I so every single library across Northern Ireland not significant in terms of hosting, and we're also hosting all of um, education. That's a thousand sites. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large kind of undertaking. Um, the kind of um, hosting facility in our data centres is almost as big as what it is that we're already hosting for the whole of the NICS infrastructure. So um, we're working at pace and we're 
onboarding those kind of large organisations where we can make a difference. Hmm. I, I still haven't heard the names of any of the groups that maybe are not on board. And this is the case, they don't have the capacity within their own organisation to meet standards that are required in order to be and not to be a part of the whole. Um, <clears throat> I think it's in in in, um, in a lot of those cases. Um, it may be arm's length bodies of individual departments, um, so there will be a relationship between a lot of those arm's length bodies and their parent department. Um, and um, I mean, it's something that we can um, encourage more um, by and from across departments. Uh, we can't do this on our own, um, but we, we have a good network across our departments, and certainly something that we will um, be pushing for um, across our um, networks. Matthew. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> it's quite a big question for everyone, but, but if possible, could the head of each division give a brief summary of their main challenges pr um, raised by Brexit and what you're doing to mitigate them? If, feel free to be as brief as possible. I'm, I'm sure there will be some that are more um, sensitive than others. Well, I'll, I'll start. Oh, I think it's a question of, of responding to whatever happens. I mean, uh, I'm responsible for delivery of the finance service and the HR services in line with the, the, the terms and conditions. For example, HR is in line with, with civil service terms and conditions and whatever comes down the line through employment law and so forth. So without knowing what that's going to be yet, um, we just have to be ready to make any changes, uh, you know, maternity allowance, maternity pay, all, all that type of thing. Uh, so it would be implementing whatever is subsequently agreed. On, on the finance side, we're not expecting too much uh, difficulty. We've had reassurances through their banking provider and so forth that, that there won't be any major difficulties. So in terms of delivering transactional services, uh, I think it's just about watch and wait and see what, what happens and be in a position to respond to it. But we don't really know what the, I mean, a bill is going to be a bill of debits uh, and a credit still going to be a debit and a credit. You know, pay is going to be what is agreed here for, for pay. The, the changes may be around HR policies that were either driven by Europe and which may or may not change. Uh, well, it's a more longer term thing rather than... Yes. Yeah, the, yes. The, the, yeah. I suppose from, from my perspective in looking at what the next generation shared services or, or technology for HR payroll and finance services would be, it is likely that, we'll, and, and Maggie's already talked about, we'll be pushing towards cloud-hosted services. So issues around data sovereignty, sovereignty and the residents of that data is going to be an issue that we're going to come up against, yep. um, which we will have to take advice on, um, both from a, a legal perspective and from a technology perspective. The other thing I would say is that shared services provided that we, we talk about here actually, in my view, help to address big issues like Brexit. For instance, <coughs> if we think about um, when we had departmental restructuring. Um, the fact that we had shared services and went from 12 departments down to nine, everybody on the Monday morning when those departments were reduced from 12 to nine was able to come into their desk, have IT, have their finance system, have their HR system. So actually shared services is a facilitator and enabler of, of some of the big changes that we might face. It's hard to think what those are going to be in terms of Brexit, but I think our job and what we have been focused on is ensuring that we are equipped to deal with whatever, yeah. um, whatever comes yeah. our way. Um, last year I led a, a review of <coughs> the services that um, Department of Finance are responsible for, um, for those operational IT services. Um, I also um, was responsible for um, looking at a level of preparedness for all departments in terms of data access um, and certainly I know in Department of Finance um, we know where our data is held and stored. We, are, we know contractually where third parties are hosting the data and what services we have assurances that um, those services can still be delivered in a post-EU exit scenario. Uh, most other departments are in the same um, category. Um, some still have work to do in terms of preparations. Um, data adequacy is something which um, Cabinet Office and DCMS are leading on. So that's about um, data sharing in a post-EU exit scenario across with different um, European countries. Um, whilst um, Cabinet Office and DCMS will take a lead in agreeing 
Um, that adequacy agreement, we are in very close contact with their team um, and in terms of finance department, um, that's a role which we are happy to be the liaison point of contact for the rest of the civil service. So just, so, just Matthew, just so, so for apologies, but there's a salient point here on the issue of GDPR and what happens 1st of January next year. Yep. Does Northern Ireland stay in the European GDPR system? as well as the UK system and has there any discussions been about how we, because there's obviously a lot of shared services that you will be doing with the rest of um, sort of Home Civil Service and other government yeah. departments and how that fusion of data works. My, my understanding is that GDPR still applies in a, in a post-EU exit scenario. Until, it is, no until, until a certain advisor decides he doesn't want any, he doesn't want it anymore. Well, un until um, there is any other alternative arrangements put in place, and I don't see any happening quickly. One, um, is there a specific work stream on, for example, north-south implementation bodies? How, um, talk with you how this would work for, for example, Tourism Ireland or Waterways Ireland. If they, you know, were, you know obviously, 1st of February next year, <laughs> data is, the expectation is that the UK is not, does not, it's, it's, Data processes do not become sort of inadequate um, as of the first of February next year. But is there a challenge? What's what, what is the challenge for the for cross border implementation? <clears throat> what are they doing to mitigate it? If you know. Yeah, and um, all of the, I, I can't speak for the individual kind of bus, business areas or agencies involved. <coughs> I, I do know that their parent departments had been providing advice on uh, preparations in a post EU exit scenario, um, and um, there are cases where there are um, change control notices effectively a uh, separate agreement between two bodies, uh, who, who may, one who may be in Northern Ireland, one who may be in the Republic of Ireland, having uh, a data sharing agreement specifically to continue to, to operate and run their businesses. And what may that mean in, in <coughs> practice? So someone who works for Tourism Ireland in Belfast and, or Coleraine as it is, and someone who works for Tourism Ireland in Dublin, what, so you described that sort of data sharing, the, an agreement, but what does that mean that someone who's emailing a colleague in Cole, someone in Dublin who's emailing a colleague in Cole Rain has to have a, does it have to be a sort of master agreement? That, that, that I, I, I expect that will be between the, um, the uh, either the information asset owner or the chief executive of the organisations. And obviously there, presumably there, for example, for the example of tourism, they will constantly be sharing information about visitor numbers, detail, something probably quite commercially sensitive information. Um, is, is it the case that we are completely confident that as of 1st of February next year, that will be completely seamless or are we kind of hoping that it will? Um, I, I, I can't expect that anybody can be completely confident. Um, there is so much um, work still to be done to um, understand the full implications of um, EU exit. Um, although, although, although <laughs> Today's understatement, Nicky. <laughs> 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 <Sorry. Sorry. Sorry. laughs> yes, indeed. But those 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 business areas who have got common interest, um, I expect they're already um, discussing and negotiating and, 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 and agreeing how their business will continue to operate. I don't see how they will deliberately. Um, um, look toward any obstacles um, which they both have an interest in overcoming. Okay. Um, and there are many more questions I'm sure I should be asking on this, but I can't. As, as always with this, I can't think of what they are. I used to have to answer questions in this, not asking them is even more of a challenge and <laughs> scary. Um, I had one final question, Chair, if I may, on a separate topic, which is a slightly lighter. Um, uh, and I think falls to you, Desi, possibly, which is the Northern Ireland Civil Service Art Collection. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what is the state? So the former Minister O'Malley, before the institutions collapsed, I think set up a scheme of displaying it in various places. I think all over Ireland. What, what's the status of that program? Is it still happening? Um, okay. The, um, the the joint exhibitions um, <coughs> North and South have been going on for twenty plus right. years now. I think we're in our twenty first year. So. They, have been going on for quite some time. Um, Minister Muller uh, actually set up a fund uh, and a selection body to um, invest 
in art because there hadn't been a significant investment in the art collection for, for quite a number of years. Now that will come to an end, um, or this is the last financial year, that that will be there. So um, beyond this year, I'm not sure uh, in terms of budgeting what will be available for, for the purchase of art. Um, but uh, I have no reason to believe that uh, the North South um, the, the exhibitions will continue. But what was this? Was this was a fund for buying art, and was it relatively? Presumably, it was a relatively modest sum. Yeah, it was uh, about forty thousand pounds um, ongoing. Okay. Yeah, turn on that. Little value. Sorry. But just I'm interested. I, I know what the spend is, but is there a value on that art collecting at the moment? And the art total off the top of my head. Because uh, it has been it's, it's a couple of million, I think, right. is the, the, the total value that will last. I remember. Mm -hmm. Jim, would, would it be possible to have an art exhibition tied in with the centenary, since these are the assets owned by Northern yeah, Ireland? We're, we're very happy to facilitate an <coughs> art exhibition if people want us to provide certain pieces. Drop us a line, come and have a look at them. Thank you, Mr. John. Okay, Do you thanks, want me to ask this, answer the second oh. part, Chair? Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> About the EU, I think. Um, just to summarise what everybody else has said, the, the first bit of my responsibilities in providing the accommodation related services, I, I can't see how that would be impacted yeah. in mm -hmm. terms of accommodation. The building regulations, now the, the framework there, the, um, it probably depends in terms of how the member state will deal with that um, because they're, they're, we are, things like Mr. Alistair raised in terms of energy performance. A lot of that uh, was through EU directives and through EU legislation. Some of the powers that we have um, used uh, to do various things would also be EU related, but that is not specific to us. That would be something that the member state would have to, to look at as a whole and see how that would be taken forward. Um, I don't think it'll affect the art collection and I don't think it'll really have much impact on the storm of the state ground, so that's, that's a pot run through ourselves and probably situation. Okay. okay. And my apologies, Desi. You're in no, mid no, flow. No, it's, 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 wasn't going to let you up. Wasn't going to wait 60 days for you to pay it anyway. <laughs> right. Sean? Thanks, Sean. In terms of uh, access to broadband, how does that impact on your operation? Or would you just have difficulties in certain regions? Um, I think that um, access to broadband, clearly, um, we would like to see more access to broadband and um, the um, broadband services, um, I understand, has got to about 87 per cent, maybe more, across the province. Um, don't quote me on that figure. I'm, I'm not an expert in broadband um, mm -hmm. services. I'm not responsible for rolling out broadband. Um, but clearly, the more broadband um, access there is for the public mm -hmm. to access, um, um, it makes um, access to government services much much easier, and they can avail more of um, both NI Direct and the services which we d um, deliver as departments. Yeah, I'm just thinking that you know West Ban has a lesser access, and coming in on Desi's point about decentralisation, bringing jobs on stations out to the places like Enniskillen, could yeah. have difficulties in that term. Um, absolutely, and I think there needs to be um, there, there. There are still um, areas of the province that are that are hard to provide some of those services to. Um, I know that there are other technologies that are available that that kind of bridge the gap between um, broadband services and um, the significant cost of getting some of those lines. <coughs> I know that in some cases the use of uh, satellite technology and other um, alternative uh, microwave technologies is available um, and um, clearly the more um, uh, focus there is on closing that gap, um, it's in everybody's interest. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Desi, Colin, John, Peggy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your forbearance and thank you yes, very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you.
Uh, team, the next item on the agenda is the written brief on the departmental response regarding the voluntary exit scheme evaluations. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the clerk's briefing paper on page uh, 24. Uh, the Department of Finance's post-project evaluation report on page 25. The departmental response to the voluntary exit scheme evaluations on page 48. And departmental response to the committee's request for further information from its meeting on the 12th of February, which is table papers 2 to 15. Um, well, there's a couple of questions that I think I've already alluded to them in uh, closed session, but um, I would just like to ask the committee's view and need to speak a response from the department, namely. Um, paragraph 4 states that the evaluations did not include the specific questions included in the committee's brief. This is despite questions 1 to 4 being based on factors that the department reported in its original response as contributing to the success of the scheme, which I find a bit confusing. Uh, paragraph 6 covers actions taken by participating organisations on strategic workforce planning, and some specific examples have been cited at paragraphs 8 and 9 in their brief. Um, interestingly enough, none of the examples presented relate to the departments, only to arm's length bodies. Um, which of the schemes participating? Some of the questions are like, which of the schemes participating in the voluntary exit scheme did not form part of the wider strategic workforce planning, including the number of people applying to leave and the actual number of successful leavers? I haven't actually got that date anywhere. The number of evaluations specifically undertaken in relation to the examples cited, how these evaluations were determined to be successful, and how this information was used to assess the overall success of the scheme. In paragraphs in 18 and 23 suggest that the staff complement across departments and the arm's length bodies is not known, since the information is not held by the Department of Finance and Personnel. I, I just find that incredible. Um, so the question is, what was the total staff complement by department prior to and after the voluntary exit scheme? We don't have any answers to that. What was the number of staff in post prior to the voluntary exit scheme and the total numbers of leavers? We don't have the answers to that. And how the contribution of arms legs bodies be assessed of relevant information is not actually held by the department. And in paragraph 21-23, um, it could be interpreted that the information held by the Northern Ireland Civil Service Human Resources may not accord with what is happening within the departments or ALBs. I just can't see how the information marries up. And that sort of brings to me a question of how reliable is the information provided to ensure that the information held is reflective of the actual position. Uh, committee, um, and I've already alluded to this, uh, I was reading the documentation and I looked at the size of the brief, I looked through it and tried to get some answers. I just wanted to get a straightforward answer, is that we took seven, I think it was 700 million we took from capital to move into resource to pay for the voluntary exit scheme. And within the briefing documents at the time, there was the discussion that there would be savings made in both personnel and overall uh, in budget over a period of 12 to 17 months. Um, I, and maybe, I, maybe I just can't find it, but I can't see it. I can't see what was the delivery of the outcome of it and whether it's been effective in value for money as we come forward. So, um, and again, I was touching with uh, I was touching with Jim. Um, I would just like to you get your uh, agreement to arrange an oral evidence session from the Public Sector Reform Division of the Voluntary Exit Scheme, including on the costs and benefits of the scheme to date. Look, I, maybe I'm missing it, but I think it would be worthwhile if we had a look at this one. And also, that the post of the head of the Public Service Sector Reform Division is currently marked as vacant on the Department of Finance and Personnel Organisation chart. I think we should ask the Department of the Post if filled on a temporary, if the department, if the post is filled on a temporary basis, and what plans are in place to fill the post on a permanent basis? I think, given the complexities of the voluntary exit scheme, that an oral briefing is scheduled, and I think we schedule it for the 25th of March, and that in advance of this session we seek responses to the issues previously outlined. Uh, team, could I have your approval for that? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Uh, can we move on to? Would anybody like a short break? I, I, I realise we've been going on for about an hour and 20 minutes. Anybody like a short couple of minutes break? Yeah. No. Nope. Right, we'll continue. All right. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Northern Ireland Public Service Alliance uh, and to come and talk to us about, indeed, the voluntary exit scheme, civil service pay and HR policy matters. I'd like to invite Alison, Carmel and Tina to come and join us, please.
Um, team, I'd like to, to talk about the following briefing papers relating to this agenda. Uh, Clark's briefing paper on page 150 and the NIPSA briefing paper on page 152. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much indeed for meeting earlier on today and I've already briefed the committee about that but uh, delighted to hear from you and uh, welcome. Okay, thank you very much and thanks very much to the committee for agreeing to uh, meet with us because I suppose our issue was we wanted to talk to the committee about civil service pay and then in the letter and the communication from the clerk, um, some issues around VES and I think it said some issues about, about pensions, which is a whole day in itself. <laughs> um, so um, maybe if I could start with the issue uh, of uh, civil service pay and you have the briefing paper uh, in your pack. Um, and suppose from our point of view is that um, like many other workers across the, the public sector, uh, but not just the public sector, is that civil servants have received um, significantly below inflation pay increases uh, since the Chancellor of the Exchequer at UK level introduced a public sector pay freeze uh, 100 days, I think, after he uh, came into to, to power uh, back in 2010, which uh, seems uh, quite a while ago. Uh, and then really since over that 10 year period, civil servants, like other public sector workers, have either received no pay increase at all or have received 1% pay increase uh, and the details of that are in your packs. The, um, the last uh, increase which was effective from 1st of August 2018 but wasn't paid uh, until 11 months later was uh, imposed uh, pay of 1.25%. And suppose the, the background uh, to this is that at that point in time um, is that our members uh, had had enough, um, quite frankly, and uh, we had a um, industrial action ballot uh, on foot of the imposition of the 1.25% uh, and our members voted uh, to take uh, industrial action and that action commenced on the 26th of July last year and there's been uh, different uh, action uh, and action short of strike action since July uh, 26 uh, last year. Uh, and I think, suppose, um, when the New Decade New Approach uh, was published, um, is that we had hopes and expectations uh, that given uh, at that point in time, certainly when you read uh, the first uh, sort of introductory paragraph, was around the issue of a resolution of the potential resolution of the health uh, workers who had <coughs> been on industrial action in the month of December. Uh, and while that was very much welcomed, uh, it goes on on the next page and talks about teachers' um, pay and a resolution needs to be found of that, and absolutely it needs to be found. Um, but you can imagine uh, the um, surprise. Uh, and uh, concerns raised by civil servants and about our members who had been on industrial action for six months plus at that stage, um, but they didn't get mentioned at all. Um, so the thought was, are we not even on the political radar um, at this point in time? Uh, and they were very concerned because if you, and which every one of you will have read in detail, um, there was two lines that referred to civil servants and arm's length bodies and that was one that would be a rationalisation uh, within six months of the establishment of the uh, political institutions of arm's length bodies and that there was a half a line on civil service reform. And while um, that might be issues that need to, to be certainly looked at, uh, you can, I'm sure you can appreciate that our members were very concerned that there was no reference whatsoever uh, within the document uh, to civil service pay. Um, certainly what our members tell us, and there's on top of page two, there's an issue there. Just, And this is not used in any other uh, inflationary measure other than produced by the uh, Bank of England. And you can see, had those inflationary increases been applied, this is the gross amounts uh, for the various grades that uh, civil servants would receive in, in the various grades had those inflationary rates. So that's really just a standstill uh, point. Um, and suppose, from, from a finance committee point of view, what we uh, believe very strongly is that um, our members spend their money in the local economy. Um, you know, they either be in shops, restaurants, uh, and local businesses, and therefore uh, an above inflationary pay increase or any pay increase is paid in local economy. And as we know, our economy here is uh, fairly stagnant. So, 
an above inflationary pay increase would at least try to uh, address some of those issues. It won't address all of them. Uh, I think the other issue is, which was in the NDNA, is the um, is the issue of childcare, and I do hope uh, that the Assembly uh, quite quickly bring in a childcare strategy and address the issue of high childcare costs uh, across uh, Northern Ireland. And you will see an appendage to that where there's uh, where we have actual these are actual members who came to us and said, "Here's a real life story," and there's one in there about. Uh, a lady who's at staff officer level, uh, which is sort of um, on the middle management level, and she has two children. She's had to reduce to four days a week just to try to uh, pay her childcare costs. So, um, if that's what it's like, if you're on about thirty thousand a year, it's a lot less. Uh, if you're uh, an AO in the civil service, uh, and many people rely on the goodwill of family and friends for childcare. So, I hope that's something. That can be addressed. Meanwhile, over the last year, we have all <coughs> had to pay as civil servants increased pension contributions and increased national insurance contributions. I think certainly in the last um, month, the the 2019 Northern Ireland Civil Service People's uh, Survey uh, has been published, and I presume as the Finance Committee, you have already uh, seen that. But if you hadn't, um, I would ask you to look at it in its full. And I've just picked out the bits that are about pay and reward. Um, and I think they are stark. I think they reflect very poorly on how uh, civil servants believe they have been treated in relation to pay. Because if you look at B35, I feel my pay adequately reflects my performance. 25% um, of civil servants believe uh, they are paid uh, sufficiently, which is a change of 5% from the previous year. Um, satisfied with the total uh, benefits package, 35%, uh, and compared to people doing a similar job, 25%. So I think from a civil service employer point of view, those are pretty um, poor statistics. Uh, and about, I think there was certainly um, about 60% of civil servants responded to the people survey. Um, this is uh, carried out by NISRA and follows very much the UK um, uh, surveys as well. Um, so I think certainly from our point of view, we just think that clearly demonstrates that civil servants think uh, that they're very, very much undervalued by their employer. So part of uh, the establishment, uh, re-establishment after three years of the political institutions, I think this is an opportunity uh, for ministers and for the assembly to get behind uh, civil servants. Uh, and I appreciate, you know, there's six hundred million pounds of uh, money needs to be found. Uh, is that, that it can't all just be uh, for civil service pay, and we're certainly not asking for that. But maybe just to um, leave you with the thought around that is that for £8 million, pounds, that's an additional 1% increase in uh, civil servants' uh, pay. So I think you know when you're £600 million pounds, uh, in the red, another eight, <laughs> couple of £8 million pounds is, is not um, going to make a huge difference. Um, in relation to um, on the grounds that on the grounds, what? Alison, that we are responsible and keeping a good eye on the public purse, we would have to take issue with that. <laughs> well, uh, I think the the other issue is is that um, during uh, the period, uh, the last number of years, and certainly what we have been in, certainly even last year and previously, it's about oh well, you need to give up something to get something. Uh, so. Uh, what are the cash release and efficiencies? You know, if you give up something, uh, what would that produce by way of cash re uh, releasing efficiencies? And that's very difficult uh, in any situation uh, because uh, if you take, for example, you know, if you're not getting into, I mean, we haven't had any negotiations on pay increases due from uh, last August. Um, so you're this far into the year, and you know, you're all in the finance committee, so I'm not going to uh, lecture you about financial issues, but. There is no cash efficiencies that can be squeezed out, you know, in two or three months. Mm -hmm. And certainly, HR Connect, who are the external providers of the payroll, um, are, in our experience, it, uh, is it takes three months from the date that we would agree a pay increase uh, to HR Connect, but able to deliver that into the pay uh, of our pay uh, packets of our members. So we're heading potentially, I would think, at this stage for another July, another 11 month. Um, at least, at, at very most, uh, as early as possible. Um, 
just maybe the next paragraph highlighted our claim, which was for an above inflation pay increase, pay restoration on some <coughs> issues around scale shortening. Um, and we think that, in the current climate, is uh, both realistic and very much justified. Um, we um, welcome the fact that um, the Assembly Commission, of which some of you will be on the Assembly Commission, and recognise the staff who work in this very building. And last year they received a 2.7% increase. Um, and this year uh, we have just signed off. In fact, I think they got, are getting paid this month. Or maybe last month they received a, a 3% increase in scale shortening down to, to two points. Um, the audit office for admin staff, they had a two-year pay deal, 2.5% for admin staff, 4% for audit staff. Um, and the PSNI officers, 2% uh, for 1819 and 2.5% um, uh, for 2019 uh, 20. So I think these are the ballpark figures, certainly, in our claim that we think is realistic uh, and justifiable. And as I understand it at this point in time, um, is that certainly we have met with the Finance Minister, we have uh, been seeking meetings with a number of uh, political parties to put forward our case. <coughs> and I understand that potentially at this point in time that the Minister did raise the issue orally with his ministerial colleagues on Monday of this week. So I think we're, we're, we're making some progress. Don't know what the quantum of that was. Uh, so I think you should all influence your ministers to once try to get this over the line uh, so at least we can get into some pay negotiations but also that it's in those uh, at least uh, a quantum of, of that level. Uh, and I think this issue about um, civil servants and other public sector workers not receiving any pay increase, whatever that is, for 11 months is something we really, really need to uh, address because it's difficult for uh, us as a union to go out and start consulting, which we do, on what the pay claim should be for next year when you haven't even got into negotiations for this year. Um, so it's an annual problem we need to resolve. I understand that potentially the Assembly and Ministers are looking at uh, multi-year budgets going forward and that potentially could lead to multi-year uh, pay awards something certainly I would welcome but it has to be of the right quantum um, because you know this is sort of an annual cyclical thing and I'm now starting to think uh, about how we're going to consult members on a claim for August uh, 2011 so this this is a, a problem uh, not of uh, any are making certainly um, I appreciate we all absolutely appreciate uh, the financial situation that the, the Assembly finds themselves in, you know, when you have such a, a shortfall. However, this issue hasn't gone away, won't go away and does need to be addressed. Um, so I hope that can be resolved in the next uh, period of time to at least let us get into uh, pay negotiations. And we have tentatively set aside a date of the 12th of this month, which hopefully we can commence our negotiations with the uh, employers if they're given a remit uh, by the, the Minister. That's really what I want, the main issues I wanted to raise, um, Chairperson, in relation to um, the next pay. Do you want me just to no, just keep address up, just the other issues? Yeah, to address the other issues. Yeah, uh, in please. relation to the voluntary exit scheme, and I can see that the committee is very exercised by this. and. Perplexed rather what? than exercised. Exercise we'll be exercised issue, after we so, stop being perplexed. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, as everybody knows, it's a rose out of the fresh start agreement. It wasn't something that NIPSA uh, wanted at the time. However, you know, that was a political decision. Um, 700 million, as you know. Um, some of that was for mainstream civil service, others were for uh, arm's length bodies, and you seem to have a, not been getting all, all of the information uh, that you require. Um, from the post-project evaluation report is that it was just short of 3,000 uh, posts that exited the civil service, as we understand it. Um, and um, I suppose the issues for us, it was not something we were in favour of. Um, it was done um, very, very rapidly. It was done on least cost, out the door. This did cause, um, some of this is uh, anecdotal uh, evidence, but some of this did, did cause some problems. So, for example, just one example I'll give you is that um, meat inspectors is that I think there was too many 
meat inspectors went out, then there was issues around, and I'm only using that as one example, and then that caused some difficulties for the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development to, to be able to uh, deliver the service, and you know there was had to be some uh, issues arose there. But that was the scheme. That was the scheme that was put together. Uh, it was least cost, out the door, um, and um, some of those issues didn't really seem to take uh, any uh, cognizance of, of issues of workforce planning. I have to say the workforce planning probably is something that we as a trade union have been raising now for quite a number of years. We don't believe workforce planning is uh, adequate, um, and I think that's I'm using that term very loosely. Um, I think we're, they're trying to get there, but uh, they've been trying to get there from the nine new departments uh, were set up, and I think the issue of workforce planning arising out of uh, the voluntary exit scheme exacerbated uh, by Brexit, uh, because then there was uh, arrangements needed to be put in place to fill Brexit-related posts. Um, and, but I think the issue for us is there's also been an exponential rise in the uh, agency uh, workforce. I mean, we were uh, involved in the uh, negotiations uh, around what should be in uh, the contract. We welcomed um, the Swedish derogation within the new contract. However, um, agency workers should be used within the Northern Ireland Civil Service or any other employer to fill maternity leaves, long-term sick leaves uh, and uh, other uh, issues like that. However, what has actually happened is that we have thousands of agency workers uh, within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Do we know, do we know how many exactly? Um, we have at least 1,600, um, potentially more. Somewhere, so it's somewhere between sixteen hundred and two thousand, and I think that um, issue sort of fluctuates. Um, and I think one of the issues is, is potentially within your figures could be is that there is two big areas that use he heavy users of the agency worker contract, and that is um, within the child maintenance service and within the um, plaza, which delivers benefit advice uh, to England. So the DWP contract, which is delivered here in Northern Ireland, in child maintenance service, more than half the workforce is made up of agency workers, uh, mainly at administrative officer level. And I think there's about 300 plus maybe in the um, plaza. So sometimes those are not uh, incorporated uh, into the figures, uh, the agency worker figures, because that's paid out of uh, DWP money. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that might be something that the committee want to, to drill into. But the issue for us is that these are people who have no loyalty or commitment to the organisation, and that's not a fault of the agency workers. That's a fact. If you don't have a permanent job, if a better job comes up, you will leave and go there. The organisations um, that are big users um, spend many, many thousands of pounds on uh, people hours in relation to training. If you take the child maintenance service, I think the training is about a six-month training program um, for the, the, the staff involved, and many of them, our branch there, did some very good work. And within 12 months, so if you took somebody from start to finish, 80% of the people who had started 12 months previously had left. So this is a big waste of money in relation to uh, training, and that's not the fault of the agency workers. It's the fault that they haven't got permanent jobs. We have been in negotiations over the last probably two years on this issue, and I'm pleased to report to the committee that we managed um, before Christmas to um, have an administrative officer permanent competition uh, launched. Uh, and that's going to be, but that's going to take. They're going to take 300 now, and I think hopefully they'll be available into the system in early summer. And then, you know, because you can't replace everybody. There was 11 and a half thousand or thereabouts uh, applicants, um, so there's plenty of supply. But they need to do this in a managed process because you just can't take, you know, 500 people out of the child maintenance service and replace them, or you won't be able to deliver uh, the service. But I think certainly. Um, sorry, just going to, sorry, Alison. Did you say eleven and a half thousand applicants? Yeah, uh, eleven and a half thousand uh, successful. Really successful. Yes, I think there was fifteen and a half thousand applicants and eleven and a half eleven thousand seven hundred. For three hundred um, plus. For that initial. No, no. And, sorry, um, eleven thousand seven hundred who got through the uh, test process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
um, and then they're bringing them through in tranches um, for, for interview because you can't just take three hundred you couldn't just run a big long competition um, and potentially replace the whole 1600 uh, in one fell swoop because that wouldn't um, be, be possible uh, or desirable for, for training really uh, and to be able to continue to deliver uh, the services that uh, is required. Um, so I think there's issues about uh, workloads and again in the people survey I've highlighted that uh, while 62% responded saying that acceptable workloads is that that means you have 38% who think they are, are overworked um, and their workload is, is unacceptable. Um, and I think potentially that look, looks into the issue of sick absence and we as a union are very concerned uh, and have been raising this issue with the civil service management and you know hopefully we can get into a better arrangement around uh, sick absence levels which are high uh, except they're high, but mental health uh, is one of the, the main reasons, and that really hasn't changed over the next period of time or over the last 10 years, uh, and I think needs to be addressed um, both within the civil service but also within wider society. And obviously, the issue of mental health is one of the issues that's come before the assembly, I think, in the last uh, short period of time. Sorry, right, just, just to interject there, sort of the clerk has mentioned a very interesting point because, again, some of the data we don't have. It would be interesting to compare the sickness rates before the VES to where the sickness rates are now. So that might be a direct causality if there was to be one. But if we were content, uh, members of the committee, to ask for that information. Mm -hmm. Content? Agreed. Sorry. Um, that's all I was going to say around VES. Um, in relation to uh, pension, um, and I did. Uh, speak to the clerk or the assistant clerk around well, some issues about pension. Well, we could be here for a whole day on the issue of pension alone. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm particularly going to talk uh, on a couple of issues. One is the McLeod judgment, which the committee will be aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and two is, um, if the committee is not already aware, is that pensions is a devolved matter. And therefore, I think at some stage um, in the next short period of time, perhaps the Finance Committee would want to take some evidence from the wider, uh, what is called the Central Consultative Working Group, which is made up of all trade unions, um, both under the Northern Ireland Ec 2 umbrella, but also uh, wider than that. Um, you know, like for example, the RCN and other unions that are not uh, within Ec 2, and we meet on a regular basis. We have had briefings, we have had government actuary over uh, to talk to us about some of the issues arising out of McLeod, which are complex and um, not straightforward. Uh, we have been, we have responded to an HM Treasury um, sort of initial cut, I would call it at how to address the issues arising out of the McLeod judgment, which says that the, the transitional protection on age was, aged, uh, was discriminatory on the grounds of age and therefore needs to be addressed, and all public sector schemes now have to address that. But there's winners, and there, potentially you just can't put everybody back. There could be winners, there could be losers. And the three issues, suppose, at this point in time, in the pre-consultation from HM Treasury was to do you say to people now, or at a point in time in the future, do you want to make a choice, what they call an immediate choice, on what your options are? Um, do you want to have a deferred choice, so you would defer your choice until that point of retirement, and for some people that would be fairly soon, and for others that could be 30 or 40 years down the road, and I think the concern might be there, well, can we trust government with our pensions? Um, and the other issue that the trade unions have put forward through this consultation, uh, which we have submitted in the last few days, is in relation to looking at a hybrid model, because these are very complex issues. People will potentially breach annual, annual allowances, um, and these are far from simplistic. The other issue that we believe is that this wasn't anything that was of uh, scheme members doing. This was implemented by government. Um, is that un trade unions, um, uh, the various public sector schemes, cannot give financial advice. We're not uh, regulated by the Financial Services um, Authority. And therefore, we believe, uh, and it's in our submission, that this is something that 
government will have to address because people <coughs> will need financial advice to make sure they make the right choice and we believe government needs to pay. Um, but this is a devolved matter um, and therefore I think that we need to have, whether it's in a formal session or an informal session with the committee, uh, once uh, further things develop over the next period of time. We didn't submit our comments directly to um, to Treasury or to the Cabinet Office on this, we sent them to um, civil sir, or sorry, to the head of uh, pension, public sector pensions here, Grace Nesbitt, who I think was here giving evidence a couple of weeks ago, and they can do whatever they think is the appropriate thing to do uh, with our comments. Our comments are not dissimilar to comments that have been made by other public sector unions um, in uh, GB. Uh, around issues around hybrid models, uh, etc. There will then be a formal consultation. We're not quite sure of the timing of that, uh, and I think that's potentially when we would want to come uh, as a wider, uh, not just NIPS, as a wider trade union, uh, maybe to the committee to talk through some of those issues. There are, There is another issue that we're very concerned about, uh, and that was certainly from the civil service point of view, is that through, we had carried out a consultation, we had been involved in that, our civil service pensions had carried out a consultation, uh, we had responded to that consultation, we had reached agreement because of what they call the cap and collar issue, where the, uh, the floor had been breached. And at that point in time, what we said was is that uh, this issue needed to be addressed uh, and that a new accrual rate uh, was introduced, which would have been of benefit to scheme members. However, at Westminster level, um, the uh, minister with responsibility uh, said is that, no, because of the McLeod judgment, uh, all bets are off, and therefore we believe this is a devolved matter and we would want to come and talk uh, separately to the committee on the detail of this, and we would also want to raise it uh, with the minister. We are um, seeking uh, legal advice on this issue because potentially um, this is something that uh, has been um, implemented. The um, MEP scheme members haven't got the benefit of the additional accrual, uh, not just in the civil service scheme but in other schemes, and therefore it, I think it will be something that will come in front of the Assembly uh, once we have bottomed uh, some of the issues uh, out on this. But it is a potential issue that the Assembly and this committee will have to grapple with uh, over the, the next uh, period of time. Okay. Thank you. Question? Jim. Um, uh, first of all, on the McLeod Amy judgment, you know, Chris Nesbitt gave us evidence. Um, thankfully, the cost, whilst it's a devolved matter, the costs are Amy funded and not block grant. <laughs> Obviously, we take a very different view. Um, if the money is coming from the Treasury, than coming out of DFP here in Northern Ireland. So, no, we don't, Jim. Well, <laughs> I suppose technically we shouldn't, but we do, in the sense that the bottom so. consequence <laughs> is that 3% 3 3 of that comes from us, from our pot, mm -hmm. which, if it was coming from the block grant, frankly, we couldn't afford it uh, because of the implications. The reckon it's going to be a billion pounds to make up the difference to put people back into the final salary pension schemes. So that's why I'm saying, you know, we're not worried to the same extent if we had to come up with a billion pounds to pay for it. Now, the other issue is, um, why do you never mention incremental payments any time you give evidence to any committee in the Assembly or publicly? Now, I'll give you an example. When I was Health Minister, I was berated for the fact that we were only giving a 1% increase to staff. But what the Finance Department showed me was that we're paying out £67 million a year in increments to health service staff. And those were obviously two and a half percent each. And yet, in the real world, out in sort of private business, there's no such thing as increments. You just get your, you either get um, a promotion or you get a cost of living increase. And yet, never have I seen in any of the arguments put forward by your union is any acknowledgement of that substantial payment. Do you want me to respond to those? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, in relation to the issue, and you know, I'm not going to get into the issue about well, uh, it's AME funded, and therefore it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the facts are, it doesn't matter who has to pay for this. It's been found to be unlawful, uh, and I therefore agree with that. the, the yeah. money has to be found. Um, in relation to the issue of incremental progression, so um, 
over 70% of civil servants, um, well over 70% of civil servants are on the max of their scale. So for 70% of staff, last year it was 1.25%. Uh, I accept that for some people who were not on the max of their scale, uh, so that's four point scales, is that the cost to the civil service pay bill was 2.01%. Um, on the pay bill costs, but for over 70% of staff, they did get 1.25%. Um, some people got an increment plus that. But, um, this is why, uh, and I've said in the paper, and it's our union's position, is that, similar to the uh, Assembly, is that we don't believe increments. We believe that the rate for the job is the maximum point of the scale, and our aspiration is to remove increments um, and have a rate for the job that is paid, or maybe a couple of increments, so you know, year one's your training year, and then you're fully um, fit to do the job at, the higher le at a higher pay level, and that's it. Not these big long pay scales, which there used to be a situation, uh, I recall I'm old enough, where you could have had 15, 16 points on a pay scale, and that had to be addressed as part of earlier pay negotiations, because those were um, not the recommendations. Uh, of uh, equality, uh, of how long it took you to get to the max of the scale, was the Equality Commission's recommendation. So for the first AA up to staff officer roughly has a four point pay, pay scale, above that there are slightly longer pay scales. But I think certainly uh, colleagues on the Assembly Commission have certainly recognised the issue of um, trying to address the issue of big long pay scales. Um, and. That's why I said I think there's uh, two point uh, pay scales in the Northern Ireland Assembly, and that's been reduced uh, over a period of time. But you do accept that if someone was at the top of the pay scale, there was always an increase, be it one or one point five percent. So it'd be wrong to say that nobody, nobody ever, right, the recession got nothing. No, that's actually incorrect, Jim. Um, for people on the max of the scale, so if you had been on the max of the scale. Um, and I mean, don't forget there was a moratorium for about two and a half years. Is that some people who were on the max of the scale have, did not receive through that period of time that's a, pay, a pay increase for eight years? Yes, but they were they were in high salary. No, they weren't. They were on the max of the scale, so you could have been an administrative officer on, say, for sake of argument, twenty thousand pounds a year if that was the max of the scale, and you didn't receive a pay increase for eight years because nothing. Yes. nothing. Uh, because there was no revalorisation of the pay scales for most of those years from 2010 up until two years ago when we re-established a pay increase for people at the max of the scale. That, that's, a, that's a factual position because this was something that our members reminded of us at every annual pay increase. So for example, some years they got a non-consolidated payment. Um, and some people told us their reason for leaving under VAS if they were within you know, a reasonable period of <coughs> when it been their natural retirement date is that they were actually better off retiring because they got more through increases in their pension than they did had they stayed in work. Well, they got CPI. What? Which was, they got CPI, which no. was that time was higher. No. Or RPI. No. They didn't. They mean, the uh, pensions they did. Sorry, and that's why, sorry, in the pensions yeah. they did. But uh, they, were, they were getting an increase in their pensions while there was no increase in their salary. So, on, on yes, but that's because pensions are tied to CPI. Yes. There's no alternative. You have to do that. It's a legal requirement. You, know, you can't get out of CPI and no, pension. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting uh, they should. But what I'm saying is that for people on the max of the scale, for eight years, they did not receive a consolidated pay increase. Oh, now, the word consolidated is significant here mm -hmm. because there were non-consolidated pay raises. Yep. So I mean, that's still money in the pocket of the civil servant. What? There's still, whether it's consolidated or non-consolidated, it is still extra money in the pockets of the workers. Well, it's actually sorry. Could I just say, in in comparison with inflation, it was a it was a it was a consolidated non-consolidated bonus, but it was actually still a pay cut because none of the consolidated bonuses matched inflation. So even though they got a lump sum of money, um. And, and that meant that the next year their salary remained exactly the same, and for the next year their salary remained exactly the same. So there was no increase that could then be exponentially made a difference to their salary. But the bonus they got, so let's be clear, the bonus they got was below the rate of inflation, so they were actually worse. And I think, Jim, the other issue is, is that you know when <coughs> of us go to um, 
to a bank that built in Saturday or anywhere else for mortgages and or <coughs> property is that they look at what your annual salary is. They don't say, well, did you get a wee bit extra? There, that that doesn't that. So for <coughs> people who are seeking to try to, you know, put food on the table, pay their bills, uh, etc., and get potentially get their foot on the property ladder, it only went <coughs> on, because I know this for, for, for a fact, for, for actual examples, is that any sort of non-consolidated payment you see did not go towards um, being able to secure mortgages, and we, we all know those are fairly expensive. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I've actually recently been appointed the Sinn Féin spokesperson on workers' rights, so I welcome your presentation and your briefing paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of childcare as well, the childcare strategy has been debated in the Assembly on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, so I'll be in contact around that. Um, some of the testimonials in this briefing, in this briefing paper are really, really concerning, as is the statistic that is it 38 per cent of respondents feel that their workload is unacceptable. <coughs> um, so on that, um, how many of your members are you aware of are off on sick, off work on sick leave or stress leave, or you might not? Be you aware of that? <coughs> Get off your head. No, we wouldn't have okay. those figures. Okay, well, maybe I could follow up with you on that just yep. to, to figure it. That's great. No, it's fine. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Can I just say because some of the stress um, that is that that our members are off with is actually also financial related. Yeah, I mean, if you can't make ends meet, yeah. then the stress of that that you bring from the home into the workplace and then obviously from the work back yeah, into the home. Have you analysed that? Sorry, Chair, through your union, has that been analysed? Do you have you know, some figures for that? It is, I agree with what you say. It is, it is quite impossible to get yeah. the detail of those figures. I mean, we know that many of our members rely on credit cards, um, go into, I mean, even payday loans at the end of the month. Um, Rennie and rely on working tax credits. So all of those um, statistics show. Now we don't have the. <coughs> it's impossible to get the detail of those figures, mm -hmm. um, but we do know that quite a few of our members. We, they've told us um, anecdotally that that's the issue for them. Um, so that stress yeah. brings itself into the workplace, obviously, and then causes um, absence, which obviously then costs, you know, costs money. Of course. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. And, right, sure. <coughs> yes. and the the impact of that uh, of sickness, the absence through sickness as well. I mean, has that been reported through <coughs> uh, higher levels of stress? Are you seeing that yourselves? Yeah. Yes. Well, we would be. Um, I think the issue really is that uh, we have been um, in some discussions with uh, our counterparts in the civil service management side <coughs> around how we. Uh, jointly, because we have some ideas about how we can tackle the issue, and um, because our members want to be in work, they don't want to be off sick, uh, and how we can jointly address the issue, be <coughs> around mental health, stress at work, uh, or stress up in the home, and how we can potentially address those. Because uh, unless we address that fundamental issue, uh, and that might be about, um, you know, how we can actually look what. Interventions can there be in the workplace? Um, I mean, one example is we have been working. Uh, one of our branches, or a couple of our branches, have been working with um, an organisation called PIP around mental health, uh, suicide, and those issues, um, <coughs> because these are real issues. So, and I know certainly in the Belfast Benefit Centre, um, along with the, the union and the management side jointly, have been working to try to address some of those issues because they're dealing with. Um, phone calls that are very difficult because people's benefit may be stopped. Maybe for legit, you know, not saying it's not for legitimate reasons. People's benefits have either been stopped or reduced, and our members who are, you know, at that AEO and AEO two level, uh, so entry level, are receiving calls and people have said, and I'm not over egging this, have said, well, you know, <coughs> I just can't live. I don't have money. If you, you, you personally are stopping my benefits or come across, and therefore I'm going to go and do something I'm going to end my life or I am going to uh, end somebody else's life on those issues and it's about how and you know I know this maybe sounds uh, to members of the committee that uh, this would be rare but it isn't and you can talk to the management side in those areas because these are things that whenever somebody is in despair who only has benefits to live on and that benefit is being cut that they see no way uh, out of that. Um, so we have been working um, 
jointly with uh, PIP and trying to devise a plan. We have asked the management side to set up like a working group involving some of our members, our representatives, uh, and people on the management side to sit around and look at what are all of the interventions. Maybe take some real life stories, because I think it's only in the real life situation that you can actually get in under it and what causes the issues, how can those be addressed. And because this is all about trying to reduce sick absence, because we don't want our members to be off sick, they don't want to be off sick, <coughs> but um, certainly over the last number of years. And then we get into this media scrum where, um, you know, on the Nolan Show and other programmes it will be, is that, well, the sick, civil service sick absence is X this year, um, and it, this is terrible, and here's the reasons why, and then we have to go on and seek to try to def um, defend some issues, because you never hear about, well, 60% of civil servants didn't have any days off. It's all about the absenteeism, not the presenteeism. <coughs> um, and that. that doesn't serve anybody. You know, it doesn't serve um, the union. It doesn't <coughs> serve uh, the individuals well. Uh, we did do some work uh, with the management side last year that we didn't get into that same media scrum, but we haven't really addressed the issue. Um, we want to get round the table, and I'm sure the Finance Committee uh, would welcome the reduction in sick absence in the civil service, because that makes uh, the civil service more productive, because if people are off sick, then either you have to bring in an agency worker to cover uh, their work, or else the work's not done, or its colleagues have to try and pick up the slack. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for attending today and, and for meeting me uh, in my capacity as my party's chairperson or spokesperson in finance. Thank you for your time. Let me, let me tackle that issue first with regards to sick pay. We have to always consider that civil service is made up of people. It's not a machine, it's people. But I can't help but think that whilst Sickness is real and genuine and damaging. The best place for people is in work. And there, there has to be certain leverages that prevent people going back into work if, and I'm, I'm talking about real life here and just human nature, that if you, if you can get full pay for six months, half pay for half a, uh, for a year. There's there has to be a disincentive for going back to work quickly. Now I don't want to sound harsh when a public forum, and I, and I, I you know I repeat, civil service is, is people, but but is that something that the unions are addressing or, or do you accept that that is that is that is very advantageous to, to civil service workers compared to the public or the private sector. Uh, massive difference uh, compared to an electrician going off sick and, and getting statutory sick pay. While I wouldn't want to reduce, I would want to elevate the private uh, sector uh, for better uh, benefits. Do you recognise that that is a disincentive for going back to work? Um, I don't believe it is a disincentive. I think all the members in, the, in our union in the Northern Ireland Civil Service want to be in work. It's more productive for them. It's um, more helpful, especially those who are suffering with mental health illnesses. They don't want to be at home. Yeah. Being back in the workplace is better. And the Northern Ireland Civil Service is now more strict. Those. I don't even know if they ever did happen those days of people, oh, you just, you're paid full pay for six months and the half pay for six months. It doesn't happen. I'm dealing with cases day in and day out. People who have cancer, people who have heart disease and life-threatening illnesses who are being called for dismissal within four months. They aren't even considered because the civil service are saying that they can't sustain their absence. They are not, it's, it's a myth that we are now paid as full for six months just to stay at home. If you're all, you send in your sick note to say that you're unable to go to work, that your doctor would <coughs> recommend you stay at home, you're maybe within <coughs> occupational health services within four weeks. And within six weeks, you've been called to HR to consider 
how they can sustain your absence and what can be done to get you back into the workplace. And a lot of times they won't try and help you get back into work. They're looking to say that you are, regardless of what was it that sent you home, you need to come back regardless, sometimes before that issue can be fixed or before issues can be dealt with in the workplace that are preventing you to get back in there. It, 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 is it, sure, you want to? Uh, no, no, it's okay. Yeah, it, it is. It is a massive issue. I see, and and yes, uh, I'm 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 hoping that there are mechanisms in place to incentivise people back to work, but also to encourage and, and everything else. And, and I I know because we're talking about sickness, and there's people really really sick out there who are genuine, you know, who need to be off. And I'm not getting at those people. And, and right, you've rightly said about a percentage of people who don't take time off. And of course, that is a real truth and reality, also. But I just think that that, you know, with that, there has to be something in in that truth that is making allowing people to stay off work when rightly their most healthy place must be at work. I also recognise, because I was a four-man electrician, that people, man management is very, very important, and you need a happy workforce. Looking at the people survey in 2019, which uh, we've got here, uh, I've got in my hand, some of these are stark, some of these figures are worrying. If I was a foreman and this was my workforce, I would be wanting to do something about it. Um, you know, uh, and looking at your your statements there, the statements there with regards to five statements with most negative responses, I feel that my pay adequately reflects my performance. 58 people disagree, 58 percent of people disagree with that. Uh, Compared to people doing a similar job in other organisations, I feel my pay is reasonable. 57% of people disagree with that. I could, I could go on, but you get the trend. This would worry me greatly. If I was a foreman on a building site and my workforce, those percentages were... And the one thing I would know is that production would be way down. There's absolutely no... There's a direct correlation between a happy workforce and a productive one. Absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, so... Do you see evidence that the civil service are actually taking these surveys and, and doing something with them, or are they just measuring discontent? Uh, well, I think that's something. Sort of goes, my view is is that, and our view would be is that um, you know they ha they are going certainly for the things that discontent workers the most. They're they're getting worse year on year, mm -hmm. uh, and you know I've reflected on, on the pay ones, mm -hmm. uh, but there is some others that are not dissimilar. Uh, and what we say, uh, both centrally, but also at departmental level, is that to try to address these issues, and we get our trade union side to raise these issues departmentally, because it's only at sort of that level mm -hmm. where these issues can really be addressed. But to get underneath uh, the issues about. Uh, but no doubt is that um, the one I quoted, uh, about 38% of the workforce said that there, there's too much work to do, mm -hmm. um, is that if you have too much work to do uh, then and you have to get it done, then you will skim over it. You'll get Because at the end of the day, is that it's about getting the work done, and I think that might come up in a different context in, in the not-too-distant future. Mm -hmm. But I, to go back to your issue, and I don't want to labour the point uh, on, on sick pay, but um, yes, uh, we want to have people in work, our members want to be in work, but I think when you have a statistic, um, and behind every statistic is real people, is that Unfortunately, in society now here, is about one in two people will experience cancer uh, in their lifetime, and many of those people are in the workplace. Is that um, if you're going to do a 40, 45 year career in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, maybe for that one period of time when you're going through a very difficult period in your life, that six month full pay, six month half pay does help you survive. Um, the financial burden of cancer, never mind um, what you have to go through uh, physically in relation to that. So, uh, as, as my colleague Tina has said here, uh, she represents members on a, a day and daily basis on this issue, and people are dismissed within, you know, three, four, five, six months. Because when I looked at figures a couple of years ago, I was actually quite surprised at the number of people who were on half pay, but, and I said this doesn't seem to match up. With the figures, and in talking to my colleagues who 
are at the coalface on a day and daily basis. It's because people are dismissed out of the civil service because their absence is not being sustained. Now, and can I ask, are people the being dismissed? Cancer and other are they being dismissed whilst having cancer? Mm -hmm. Would you have figures? Would you could you get us figures for that type of thing? Because you know, obviously, there's different spectrums of cancer. I get that and all of that, but really, if if if, if people are being badgered whilst being sick, that's a different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what I was using it. there, uh, Paul was is that the statistic of one or two people will unfortunately yes, experience course. cancer is that I would like to think in a progressive organisation like the civil service is that those people would be supported and that's the reason why we hold very dearly to the six months full pay, six months half pay. People are not off for that length of time because they've got a, a sore finger or they've a broken arm. You know, people are back within uh, if you with a broken arm, what is it, six weeks or something, they say people are back within that period of time. They wouldn't just get staying off because, well, it's a nice sunny day and I'll sit in the back garden all day. That, if that ever existed, those days have long gone, so they have. Uh, but I do think, and we hold very dear to it, uh, the issue of having that sick pay scheme in place because for those life uh, threatening in some cases uh, situations that people do need supported because if you look at the issues around and I'm only using cancer as one example but people recovering from heart attacks and all of those other issues not having that financial worry um, is a big help in them recovering. Mm -hmm. Can I ask the last question, last point uh, Chair? The, the, the negotiation rounds that you go through and we talked about a wee bit this in our, in our uh, party meeting it strikes me as being really wrong where there's, where there's no certainty for the future. So you guys are still have a negotiation for the, this year's tax year financial year, mm -hmm. which to me is bonkers. You, you should at least be negotiating in advance. <coughs> uh, how do we ever get into this position? And, and how do we get out of it? How do we get out of it quickly in order that there's a positive... And you did allude to a three-year budget and then a three-year pay. Now, that strikes me that you might give, you might reduce people's hope if they know what they're going to get paid. Their pay raise is going to be in three years, but at least they'll have the certainty. So, how do we get out of this cycle of of lateness and, and negotiations drawing on for months and months and not actually achieving anything? Well, the answer to that is fairly simple is that now we have ministers in place and we have an assembly and an executive in place, <coughs> is that um, these decisions are taken quickly, they're taken urgently, and the negotiations start uh, before the implementation date, which is the 1st of August 2020, for the, the next yes. for next years. We did, and I think certainly I raised, we raised it with you when we met uh, with you a couple of weeks ago, was... Um, and my colleague Carmel here will know this better than me probably, is a number of years ago we changed from a 1st of April uh, date of a pay increase um, to 1st of August. And I think the theory behind that was um, that, well, if we started the negotiations in and around March, April time, it would all be done and dusted, ready for implementation in August. But that was obviously an aspiration that has ne never been met. Um, in fact, you know, in the last couple of years it's taken 11, um, 12 months um, and that's not good. So I think certainly um, ministers, executives approving pay remits early in the process, getting into negotiations, then hopefully within the next maybe pay cycle we can reach that aspiration. I think it's in, for the benefit of everybody and for the benefit of departments being able to plan going forward Absolutely. in relation to budgets and all of those issues. Great. Okay, thank you. Matthew? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, um, guys, for your evidence so far. has been really pithy and um, to the point. Um, so a couple of diverse questions from me. Um, uh, you've indicated that the pay settlement you want for um, the financial year that we are about to end is uh, an above inflation one. Is there a more specific ask than that, or are you deliberately not saying anything more than above inflation? We're asking for an above inflation pay increase, which is back to August 2019. Yeah, so you want for 1920, you want an above inflation pay raise, but you're uh, you're entitled to do that. You're, you're a trade union negotiator, but you aren't being specific about what that means exactly. Yeah, well, what I said was is that at the point of the claim date that was due is that uh, the CPI. Oh, yeah. PIH was 1.7 percent, so we're looking for at least that, plus a bit more for pay restoration. 
And, and the purpose for that, yeah. Mr. O'Toole, just sorry, that yeah. you know, we, over the last twenty, over the last ten years, yeah. some of our members have lost up to twenty percent by the fact that they have had <coughs> low inflation pay increases. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in previous years, we, we put forward a, we, we named a figure. Yeah. So we asked for five percent or seven percent, um, and and that became now almost like you know monopoly money when when you start to to. To ask for the figure that we need, I think it becomes mm -hmm. almost unreal to, you know, to politicians, to yeah. um, the public. So I, th I think that our members are now saying, look, you know, if we ask for 20 percent, people will laugh at us, but that is what we require. Right. So what we are saying now is above inflation, mm -hmm. so that we stop losing, and whatever we get above inflation, that we can then build on exponentially. So essentially, it's as much as can be afforded above inflation to try and claw back the loss. So, um, you know, and, and, and that, I mean, it's no more scientific than that. It, it, yeah. It's just, it became almost farcical if we continue to yeah. increase our claim in line with what we believe we need and what our members deserve. And, 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 pay, and movement towards pay restoration, that's to be negotiated? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, that's fine. I just wanted to to get a bit of <coughs> clarity on that, um, uh, and you have had, you've met with the minister already to discuss that, and I suppose you'll be waiting to hear more from him in, yes. in the budget, basically, when he. Um, uh, back to my hobby horse. What have your members been telling you about increased workload as a result of Brexit? In relation to Brexit, is that um, because particularly in some of the big Brexit uh, departments like Justice, um, Agriculture, um, and, uh, and, and Infrastructure and uh, Economy, is that we agreed with the management side a quicker way of filling posts uh, to try to address the issue about Brexit. But it, as I said, I think during my presentation, it almost feels to us a bit of an industry. I'm not saying there isn't lots of work to be done. Um, and certainly when you talk uh, to those uh, members in those areas is that there is plenty of work to be done um, and it isn't sort of a something that will be done over a year or maybe two years these posts are likely to be needed for, for quite a period of time uh, with some uh, expertise around that particularly maybe around legal um, and, and those issues and I'm sure that's something <coughs> that they will be looking forward but Matthew could you maybe just go back over your question again because I think I've lost the train of thought. The question is basically um, how, what kind of increased workload in general, in broad terms, have your members been um, indicating as a result of Brexit and any, and, and indeed any sort of workforce stress questions related to that, but, but, but it is really about workload. And then I have a follow-up question about headcount. Uh. I suppose it goes back to the issue of VES and the fact that we, because there hasn't been any recruitment, we've lost people over mm. the last number of years. We've lost significant expertise in the civil service. So Brexit was something that the civil service here wasn't prepared for yeah. and has been... Civil service in London wasn't prepared for it yeah, either, but <laughs> maybe, I can maybe tell maybe you. To, maybe to, to a better degree, I suppose. But, um, so it has been... It has been a huge burden on a lot of our members. Um, it has caused significant stress. Um, obviously, they're not known as cost stress, but the additional workload has mm. caused um, stress now. Um, but also sorry. then, the movement of staff into Brexit post has left a lot of voids in other okay. departments and other areas as well. So that's that's my, my next question. Do you, and this is a question uh, you know we can ask the department. But since you're here and you've been so um, helpful thus far, do you have a sense of what the head, sort of increased headcount as a result of Brexit, or number of FTE posts that have been created as a result of Brexit, or Brexit-related work? I think we do have those figures back at the office, yeah. but that has been supplied by the um, OF. But I would, you know, don't, don't want to quote a figure because way do you, off. Do you know, would it be would the number of extra jobs created by Brexit or extra pressure created by Brexit be um, in excess of the number of posts that were? Done away with through theirs. No, wouldn't mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. No, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be of that magnitude. Right. Okay. I think the issue is um, was is that is well was um, during the three years when the assembly wasn't in place and you know private offices didn't need to be staffed up at that point in time. Mm -hmm. After a relatively short period of time, people <coughs> moved out of private offices and the other mm -hmm. jobs across the civil service, and then. 
when the assembly was restored again, quite quickly, you know, because we've had these ups and downs, is that I don't want to use the word panic, but there was certainly a big push that people were taken out of their jobs, put back into private offices o overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've got because, some clerks here on the table. He probably, we've got some people in the room here, maybe yeah, in that position. Who were then. You know, brought back uh, very quickly, um, but even not just the assembly Indeed staff who were out uh, <laughs> on uh, the continent uh, into uh, parts of the civil and other parts of the public sector, but civil servants. I mean, I know of somebody, I say, in Nick's HR, who was told that you're going to the First Minister's office tomorrow, um, so you, you need to go because, until we can fill the post on a permanent basis. So they've had to. Uh, very quickly, um, and we, we welcome the fact that the Assembly's back, had to juggle people around very quickly to ensure, particularly in uh, private and ministerial offices, there was uh, some staff there to <coughs> do the necessary work. But you're saying that from the union, from the union's perspective, they weren't, were the, pl the plans were in place, but they weren't quite ready to implement, to, to move people, they, they weren't expecting to move them as quickly as possible. From that Friday night into the to the well the Saturday in the case of the assembly and then the Monday Absolutely. I guess we've been up and down that hill a few times <laughs> and furnace to the civil, literally to civil servants we've been up and down a, a few times this so hill. Um, but you know <clears throat> that's only me looking in as an outsider into that situation but you know because I, I phoned to look for somebody and they said oh they've moved to the first minister's office and then one final <clears throat> question if I may chair which is uh, which is I guess it's quite a big question but you feel free to be brief or please be brief and. Um, one thing that is distinctive about the Northern Ireland Civil Service relative to probably civil service to government machines elsewhere, certainly Whitehall and I'm sure the other devolves in the south of Ireland, is that the age profile is significantly higher. Um, now, that's not a criticism per se, but um, it, it, you know, it, it throws up certain long-term workforce planning challenges. Um, does the union have a view on that and what would be, do you think that there could be Steps taken to incentivise um, the sort of the more young people joining. Uh, I would, give me your view on that. I suppose I, I do, I'm, I'm aware that that's a thorny issue. Well, um, well, in relation to, I don't know whether you mean by um, incentivise, whether you mean another VAS scheme, which we would be totally opposed to. Not necessarily, no. I, 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 um, but certainly, uh, yes, in relation to. Um, we're hoping through this um, AO recruitment uh, yeah. competition that that will bring in, you know, 15, 1,600 young people, uh, yeah. mainly young people, uh, in, and that will help uh, over the next period of time. People will get promoted uh, through their expertise. So I think certainly, but that's a long-term uh, plan mm. because I was very surprised about a year ago um, in looking at some information and, and asking some questions. But in the Northern Ireland Civil Service then, now we're talking about at least a year ago, that permanent staff, excluding the agency workers, there was only um, less than 20, yeah. less than 20 staff in the Northern Ireland Civil Service were under the age of 23 mm -hmm. permanent staff. The entire Northern Ireland Civil in Service? The entire 20, what is it, 23,000 yeah. staff. Mm -hmm. It was less than 20 who were permanent employees. Do you know what it is for under 30s or under 35s? Probably not much higher. It's a, in the because Department of, of Communities, we're looking at an average age for the admin officer of 52 or 53, which isn't also helping in um, health within the workplace. Indeed. We're all ageing, we're all getting more illnesses and we have more responsibilities at home, they're putting more pressure on us as well. But, but that age profile issue is that the Department of Finance should be able to give the committee that, mm -hmm. you know. Indeed. I don't mean quite as a press of a button, but. <laughs> but you would accept, although oh, that's not asking you to endorse a VES, there are many other ways of dealing, but you would accept that's a long term challenge for the Northern Ireland Civil Service? Yes. Okay. So you ask for that. Okay. Sean. Thank you, Chair. Um, what was the overall figure you said would resolve this issue, Alison, in terms of uh, pay restoration? That's right. Well, see if you go back to, I think it's the second page of the submission, yeah. um, that's what people have lost um, if you just had applied the Bank of England inflation uh, figures. Yeah. Uh, so for an AO, I think it's 5,800, uh, up to 16,000 for um, uh, grade six within the civil service and all figures in between. We're not unrealistic. We do not expect, after te getting 10 years, to get to that point, that in one, two or three years that all of that could be addressed. I think that, but that's our longer term aspiration, uh, to get back to something that's, that's realistic. Because I think 
the general public would be quite shocked to learn that for certainly at entry level into the civil service is that um, they got they had a three, that's at AA level and also for industrial civil servants mm -hmm. that we don't represent they are members of TMB and Unite but that they had to be given a three percent pay increase yeah. last year uh, to just bring them up above uh, the minimum wage mm -hmm. so I think that would be quite a shock to the general public to think civil servants some civil servants are were potentially paid below the living wage mm -hmm. and yeah. one of the figures that Alison gave earlier was the fact that one percent is eight million. Um, so I think, as, as I understand, the departments have already budgeted for one or one point two five percent. So to give members an additional one percent pay increase is eight million. Now we don't think an additional one percent is sufficient because that doesn't bring people to um, inflation. So when we're, you know, sixteen, um, you know, twenty four million, uh, which is not in the overall size of the of the budget. 24 million is not a significant amount of money. Now I know that, obviously, as we said mm -hmm. earlier, when there is um, when there is and everything is significant. A hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, but yeah. I mean, I think the, the, a key point yeah, in this is yeah. this is money that is going into the hands of our members, which will go yeah. straight back into the economy because you know this is money that people will spend <coughs> taking their kids to the you know taking the kids to the cinema, to, uh, going out for for family meals and so on. This is money that is going straight back in um, to the to the economy and yeah. you know and our the, members aren't wealthy enough to yeah. be to be saving it. They're, they're going to be spending it. Yeah I noticed you mentioned the healthcare workers in the I know theirs was party pay party was there mm -hmm. yes, the line, and they did get a lot of public support and uh, yeah. did you think that you weren't going to get the same? I think the issue of nurses uh, and it's not a criticism but nurses are the um, the front face of the health service um, and there's many many other professions and jobs behind that and I think they certainly had the public sympathy. Mm. Uh, their uh, civil servants uh, unfortunately don't have that same uh, public sympathy that's just a fact um, and uh, you know because if you're uh, like politicians we're, held, we're yeah. held in mutually you know, high regard. If you're working in the benefits office and you're mm. saying to somebody no you're only getting this not that you know you're not very popular mm. if you're phoning people up and say your your rates um, <coughs> bill hasn't been paid you're not very popular um, but I think if you take you know we're in the middle of the winter here some morning we get up and have to scrape the ice off our cars well civil servants grit the roads uh, uh, mm -hmm. So that we are safe on our roads, and many, 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 th you know, yeah. make sure that we have a safe uh, meat and poultry uh, on our to have for our dinner at night. Um, so good. Some of us don't have any poultry on our. Yeah. 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 Gentlemen, 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 yeah. 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 So the next um, course of action is I met the minister. So years are waiting just on the the budget statement. Is that? We, we met the, the minister. We put forward her case, yeah. uh, and uh, we. I have written to the minister in the last sort of forty-eight hours mm -hmm. um, because our members are getting a bit impatient. We have had members in the courts and the public prosecution service now who have been on selective action for four weeks, and they phoned me this morning and said, "What's happening? You know, does anybody does anybody care about us?" And I think right. that's what members are thinking. Nobody cares about us. You know, the health workers. Uh, issue has been resolved and yeah. they've forgotten about us. Now, um, as I understand it, uh, having made some inquiries, is that the Minister has put a paper or has orally spoke to his uh, executive colleagues. So we're hopeful within the next short period of time we'll be round the negotiating right. table, sleeves rolled up and getting stuck in. Yeah, so we might speak to him as well. So, because what we want is that members get a decent uh, pay increase. We want our members to, to, to not have to rely any longer on credit card debt or on benefit. I mean, as yeah. I said earlier, many of our members aren't working no, tax credits. Uh, yeah. So that's that's coming out of government funds. You know, so you've got, I mean, it is, to us it's a ridiculous situation where public servants, yeah. civil servants, um, are being, having their wages supplemented through benefit. Yeah. Um, and, and we feel that that situation. Yeah, is. we would say it as an equality issue as well. Yeah. When I joined the civil service nearly 30 years ago, it was seen that it was a career. Yeah. We're different than it is yeah. in um, Britain, where there's a lot of rotation of staff. And here, people joined the civil service, felt that there was a good career and there was good progression within it. And 
it's not happening now. I never saw, I never saw the amount of people now that will leave and go to jobs outside the civil service because the they don't feel the need to stay in it anymore. There's no, there's nothing to keep. There's no need to be retained. Mm. OK, thanks, Joe. Oh, thanks for saying, Jim. Jim, oh, sir. Yeah, uh, nurses apart, is there any parity? TV, civil service? Yeah, no. Um, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a, an issue. Um, that um, we're we're not asking for pay parity. No, I'm asking. Yeah. Is there parity? Um, um, sorry. No, sorry. Can I just? Yeah. Um, although grade structure is roughly similar, but not exact. Um, all of the departments across the water are head differently because they would pay delegation, whereas the NICS is paid as one unit. Um, every department is paid differently, but in, for the majority of the departments across the water, everybody from AO up is paid more generally than, than, are, than is paid here. Um, and that's <coughs> even though we have here, we have HMRC staff who are uh, um, based here and, and some other. So, so take your AO2. What would be the comparative salary in the home civil service to here? That grade is one that doesn't exist. So they doesn't go from... There, right. it, okay, take one that does. Sure. Okay, well, I mean, some of the figures of a difference is, is a couple of thousand pounds a year, um, generally lower here than at Right. And I suppose it can be said with a lower cost of living in some respects. Hey, how do has there been the same loss of pay traction in the senior grades of the summer service? I mean, we go up to grades. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know you've given us the figures up to grade six, yeah. uh, grade five yeah. through. Uh, have they suffered the same? They, they've more or less got the same pay yeah. increases yeah. Um, over the last number of years. Yes. Yeah. Before that, they they might have. They might have been a bit ahead in terms of what they achieved, but over the last number of years, they've generally been paid the same. A pay, I think it was a pay review body yeah. for senior civil service, mm -hmm. which has been done away with. Uh, maybe a, an unpopular question. If things are so bad, why do you think it is that for the lowest, least paid grade, there were 15,500 applicants? For 1,600 people. There aren't enough jobs. There are too many zero-hour contract jobs for young people out there, mm. and I think they don't want, want to get in the permanent posts. Um, there is still the idea that civil service is a job that you that is secure, reasonably secure. So I think desperation of young people trapped in in low-paid um, contract, you know, and, and uncertain job in the private sector. Um, do feel that they want the certainty of a job, firstly, and foremostly a contract, um, but also, I suppose, just, you know, they want to get out of the um, the uncertainty of, of uncomfortable yeah. work. Yeah, there, some of the applicants were from people with degrees and, yeah. uh, you know, well... More than well enough qualified. More than well enough qualified for the grade that they were applying for, just because there isn't enough jobs. Uh, just one question on, on the sick levels. Within the civil service, which day of the week do civil servants tend to be most sick, or most do most civil servants tend to be sick? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Don't. Has there not been some figures that Monday a bit too late? I don't have access to those. I don't have any evidence. No, we're not asking that question. Genuinely, don't. No, we're not asking that question. I think I'll ban that question. Right. Okay. Okay, Jim. Okay. okay, Alison, thank you very much. Alison, Carmel, Tina, thank you very much indeed for coming in. And we'll follow up on some of those issues that we're doing with the rest of it. Thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, team, if we move on now. Uh, sorry. Um, one of the sort of the actions of that was to ask the department for information on sick absence and also to be able to be useful to see if we get any statistics if they've got um, work related stress. As if they do have the, I hate to use the word granularity, but the granularity of those figures and their information. The age and somebody mentioned the question of the age profile of the civil yeah, service. Yeah. Would you want those figures as well, Matthew? Yeah, well, they may be easily got. I don't know if it's. Uh, I think, in fact, they will be. Very, they'll be in the workforce survey or something. So it might, I'm not sure if it's. If it's if we even need to ask for them, is this best up special? Maybe we should. Yeah, let's ask for it. Should, should be fairly straightforward too. 
Britain Department. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Tim. Uh, we move on. Chairperson's business. There is no chairperson's business. You'll be glad to know. Uh, moving on to correspondence. Uh, first item: a response from the department to the request to provide an analysis of the impact of the local government uh, pension schemes in the McLeod ruling. Uh, very germane to what we're talking today, including the impact on rate payers. Is on page one six three. Have we any comments? Uh, I would like to seek agreement from the committee uh, to forward to the committee for communities for uh, any of their information. Agreed? Mm -hmm. uh, Department response to your committee request for information regarding safeguarding pension scheme members from potential scams and transferring the scheme, page 165. That was uh, something you brought up, Paul? Go again there, Chair. It was the, about the protection against scams and scamming. And people who were opting out of the pension schemes were being, uh, I think it was, the, uh, it was the issue to do with. I was actually. Oh, it was, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, raised that uh, issue um, because of the British Steel case Indeed, in, South in Wales, Wales, where yeah. thousands of steelworkers lost their pensions to fraudsters, basically, posing as financial advisors. Yeah. Uh, are there any other comments, Tim? <coughs> Content? <coughs> Uh, correspondence from Lisney Chartered to sur Surveyors regarding payment of agreed dilapidation sums due to the company from the Department of Finance on page 169. Uh, we discussed that when there were and the members of the department were in here. I think one of the actions we came out of that, Jim, was we were asking them uh, did it refer to any other companies or any other uh, companies as well. I think, Chair, we should also ask for confirmation that it has been paid. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Uh, I'm afraid I wasn't overly happy with the answer. No. Um, there seems to be an inordinate length of time between when the legal assessors and had the sign off to when it actually arrived. It seemed like me close on nearly four to five months. Yeah, yeah. Chair, uh, if I could come in there. On one of those emails we've received, it does point out to another payment that is eight months outstanding. Right. Can we so, get some details so on that? I think what we cool. need to ask the the department is the actual process from start to finish, mm -hmm. uh, from when the the break clause is commenced, who actually negotiates for who, who represents who. They seem to have employed uh, a surveyor to do the work, of course, to get a figure. When do they have the negotiation? Who conducts the negotiation? And then if the legal person isn't employed, or the survey isn't employed to sign off. They would like to know who signed the release form. Mm -hmm. And then is it says here, I'll read the release form out, it says, it is hereby agreed that in consideration of and upon receipt of the sum of to be paid by the lessee to the lesser, the lesser will accept such payment in full and final <coughs> settlement and will release and discharge the lessee from their repair, reinstatement, decoration and all other dilapidation liabilities. It goes on to say, the lesser will send to the lessee a dated invoice for mm -hmm. the amount. So that invoice seems to be a secondary or a, an additional stage to the process. So the lesser, the lesser will send to the lessee a dated invoice for the amount payable to be made, payment to be made by the lessee within 14 days of the said dated invoice. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know when these invoices are then yep. uh, issued. And then, that obviously, the 14 days starts then. The, the discrepancy here is the date and time between the release form being signed mm -hmm. and the receipt being issued. Yeah. And I think we need to find that out. Yeah, I would particularly like to have some clarification because it seems to be the timing of it is, it seems to be completely unacceptable. Yeah. Are we content? Mm. Thank you. Um, and just want to note there aren't any remaining items of correspondence. Further items of correspondence, can I look, uh, draw your attention to the updated forward work programme on page 181. I would draw the members' uh, attention to the inclusion of written and oral evidence requested by the committee. Um, the committee's requested a written briefing on the voluntary exit scheme across the Northern Ireland Civil Service. The Department has reported that due to the information that it is required to respond to the request, it would appreciate it if officials could have an extension. So, I'm sure that has now arrived. So Good, right, arrived. happy with that. Uh, remind me, yeah, I've got that. Uh, members are content to ask the Department outline, right, we've done that. Uh, agreed to extension, yes. Uh, uh, members, are we now content to agree the forward work programmes that now sits? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We all done our homework? You didn't want to. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
Uh, yeah. One quick comment for me, Chair slash Clerk. Oh, um, we are next week. We have an inform our meetings informal. Supposed to be an informal discussion. Yeah. I wonder if it's worth just having a devoting a section of that, and it might be that we're doing it anyway, given that we are. We'll be doing it literally at, at, in the immediate aftermath of the UK budget being delivered. We are the UK. I know, Jim, but that's what I mean. <laughs> okay, it's, the UK, but it's the UK government. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> I thought you'd have known that, Jim. You yeah. <laughs> oh, us from the UK. Uh, was there a question mark at the end? <laughs> was there a question mark at the end of that, Jim? Yeah. I, um, I did used to work in the, in the UK Treasury from Howard. Um, Her Majesty's Treasury, if you prefer. That's um, better. Um, should, we, should we have a, an agenda item to discuss this? Uh, to discuss the only the only point I would say, and not to discuss it in general terms. No, but it's just the the volume of work we probably need to do, and I'm saying this, I'm putting in an apology now because I'm not going to be here. Right, okay. But the volume of work that is going to be required for uh, uh, Paul to go through on that, to look at the forward work program and do that, I don't think you will we'll have you, you would have the time to do that. That's fine. Okay. I mean, okay. It was literally just to, not to talk about it in any good detail, but just to say we had spoken earlier on about getting. So we will know initial outlines. There'll be a line. There'll be lines or two in there about potential Barnet consequentials for here. Yeah. Do we want to have an initial discussion about calling people? But we don't have to have it next week. Yeah. So is there any other business? Yeah. Indeed, yes. Uh, Chair, just to, to clarify, I, I I suppose I made an assumption that uh, members may consider the budget to be one of their priorities when it comes to next week, mm -hmm. and I've got raised on, on standby should that be the case to, to come in and talk to the committee about the budget process and, and how we're going to proceed with that. We work seamlessly together as a committee. I love that. And Sorry, to, the, to the chair, can I offer my apologies? I won't be available next week. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The committee will be bereft of its time now. Seven. Um, no, that's a good job we're doing that. Uh, just move on to any other business. Um, advise the members that there will be a motion for debate arising from the launch of the renewable heat and uh, uh, RHI inquiry on Monday. I think it's a three hour debate being led by the uh, Finance Minister on the 16th of March. Yeah. Um, I remind the members that the committee has sought a written briefing from the department on its response to any recommendations with their inquiries report, which has been scheduled for the 1st of April and then with all uh, evidence from the officials on the 22nd of April. Therefore, in terms of the debate, the committee's contribution will be limited, I would suggest, at this stage. We're not, we're not, there's no way we're going to be able to absorb the, the thousand odd pages and everything else at that stage. Uh, next thing I would just say that the second stage of uh, Jim's private members' bill is due to be considered on Monday the 16th. I'm um, just asking members the content to access committee information mm -hmm. on the consultees from Jim's bill to help inform the debate. Are you happy to access that information? Yep. Yeah. And do any other members have any other item of business they would wish to raise? Sure, just to inform the committee with what I brought up before about the small businesses and the plasma screens and the advertising. And with uh, Minister uh, Diane Dodds uh, from uh, has stated that she, she's going to ask trading standards to look at these cases and to see if business protection legislation has been breached. So I'm looking forward to that and to look at the finance agreements which go to these small businesses, which affects every part of Northern Ireland, right across with every one of our constituencies. So that's a bit of good news, I think, if she can get that to look at that. And taking in mind that it's still on the agenda for the committee and have been written out two small businesses in order to come and present to us. Okay. The Chair, would mem members be content? Uh, the committee has written to the uh, Economy Committee, copy to the Justice Committee, just to update them on that. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Sure, uh, just one other thing. Has the committee, has the committee in respect to the Department of Finance, been given any indication about the practicalities relating to the release of, or Justice Cochrane's report? No, as in copies of the report itself. As in when and yep. all of that. No, we have not. We we have not had anything yet. I don't think anybody's had any indication. Okay, Tim, uh, just coming up to the end now. Uh, next meeting will be Wednesday, the 11th of March, will be a strategic planning meeting taking place in room 29 at 1.30. My apologies and Melissa's apologies will record that. I will not be available for that. I'll be in Washington, uh, paid for by the party, not paid for by the executive. You'll be glad to know. And uh, the next formal committee meeting will be on Wednesday, the 18th of March at uh, 1400 here. And Paul, if I could ask you kindly to uh, chair that, because I will be absent in the States in that period of time. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your program. Cheers. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.